hello, I'm uh, the guy you probably think I am, even though I'm not certain you're right. I hope I am. Anyway, welcome to the fifth and final version of Brazil. In the European version of the film, we just started with the, the time and a black screen. Uh, for the American version, because people had commented on the fact that um, they didn't know the song, I thought it'd be really nice to start with the song Brazil and this great sweeping through the clouds shot. I, I quite like the song starting the, the, the film because it starts brighter and more cheerful. And then we enter the exciting world of central services. It was, it was, it was great creating our own logo and, and making a... Uh, uh, making advertising for um, something that everybody has and doesn't need. Do your ducts seem old-fashioned, out of date? Central services, new duct designs. And now I think this is my chance to get back at television because of its invasion of our lives. So what better than to start a film on a television set which is pouring out this rubbishy information about all the things we don't really need in our lives and then destroying that very thing that's invaded life. There was this constant question about why Brazil? Why is it called Brazil? And somebody had suggested Tom Stoppard as an idea someone to work with, a collaborator, and I thought, wow, that's a great one, because his cleverness with words and structure I thought would match my cleverness with images. And then he, he had a, a brilliant beginning that unfortunately we didn't shoot because we didn't have the money. Originally, the opening of the film was a, a beautiful rainforest, and there was uh, this beetle, this beautiful iridescent beetle fluttering around and landed on something, on a leaf, and suddenly you hear this roar in the distance, and the leaf, everything starts shaking, and the beetle takes flight, and suddenly the forest comes crashing down, and there's this great machine basically devouring the forest. It's ch knocking the trees down, and it sucks them into its maw, chews them up, and spews them out as, as some pulp, uh, which is, is pumped into this truck, which then drives through the road of the forest and towards the city. And amongst all that, we keep cutting to the beetle, who's now in the air, and as it flies across, and the truck drives underneath it, and the truck drives into the city, and it drives up to a plant where the pulp is dumped out, and out comes great rolls of newsprint, and the beetle flies past that. Then the newsprint is taken to another place where it's printed upon, and then the paper is, is, is collated, and a great white paper, like hundreds of pages thick, a great bureaucratic document is spewed out of the printing plant, and that document plumps on the desk of the technician that we see as the beetle flies in the technician's room, and what the, the document says, it's a huge white paper on the saving of the rainforests and the beetle flies into the room and gets squashed by that document and falls in. It's such an elegant, and that's what Tom is about, elegant solutions, is a bottle-tuddle confusion. That wasn't in there. There was a man arrested wrongfully, and there was a, uh, uh, a Tuttle character, a freelance plumber. So, I mean, that bottle-tuddle confusion was just incredible. It just it knitted things together, and, it's, and it made the film just seem much more coherent than, in fact, it was at many levels. Merry uh, Christmas, well, when I was first working on this film, I had the bottles flat, not a flat, it was a house that was out in the countryside, and I had a small house, and out of it came this gigantic umbilicus, this, this huge tube, this huge duct that was probably about f four feet in diameter, and it came out of the house and was strung on poles, just like electric wires are, across the countryside, feeding this little little cabin, basically, with all the, the, the things of society. And you know, you've got an umbilicus that, that both feeds and ties you at the same time. Jill's room, again, it was a shot. I just loved setting up this shot with all these mirrors. We've got a television set, she's in the bath, and how do you get her to see what's going on in the television set except setting up this strange series of mirrors that end up in a, uh, a car or truck rear view mirror. People are really offended by the dirt in the water. I love that. It really gets a strong reaction from people. Again, to make her more interesting, we put a bandage on her, trying to invent a kind of uh, life for this girl who, in fact, uh, very little is revealed of in the set. Our happy family. The, <laughs> the hole in the ceiling, I think, was one of Tom's ideas. I love that, that they actually have a machine for cutting open floors to make these entrances, the sliding down the pole 
I love fire. I've always loved firemen and their entrances or exits to the, to the fire station. These these troopers. I think some of this was heavily inspired by you know a mixture of Star Wars, a lot of South American repressive uh, countries. Most of the detail that I got about the, the tortures and the arrests were a very commonplace in most other countries in the world. So there was, there was very little invented. I kept telling people that this film is really a documentary. I've invented nothing. These are only things things that I've observed. The uh, man with the bowler hat comes straight out of, uh, uh, I think, maybe some German version of Three Penny Opera. Uh, the, uh, I love them. The, we made these, these bags. They're really like mail bags. I worked in the mail uh, in the post office uh, for several years, and I always loved the fact that all these letters went in these bags. The bags went hooked on on, on, on sort of conveyor belts and moved around. I thought, what what a nice way to move prisoners around. Everything has to be efficient and practical, and so we've hooked them up into a rig that can then just be moved through the system. That. Thank you. Same again, please. Just that. Press harder this time. The signing of uh, the receipts and um, pressing harder. I, is a great moment to make. I mean, the, the total brutality. I mean, the man isn't being mean, brutal. He's just being, he's going about his job. Humanity has been expunged from his way of, of seeing the world. He's got forms to fill out, and the forms are there to make sure that everybody is protected. Everybody in the society is being covered because it's all on paperwork saying that things are being done properly. I mean, the paperwork is not supposed to be a threat. It's supposed to be some kind of insurance against things going wrong. And yet everything is constantly going wrong in this world, and nobody will admit to it. The plug in the floor is just a great beginning to the fact that things don't work as they're supposed to work. Uh, again, the characters, the, the two characters, the workmen, I love workmen in my films. I like the people that do things, that mend things, that make things keep working. And that's why Tuttle becomes a great heroic figure in, 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 later on in the film. The um, tracking shot that comes up here was always one of my favorite. I mean, I storyboarded this thing. And I just loved the idea of very quickly going from the anguish of this woman to it all being tidied up on a receipt by and then showing as quickly as possible just the number of people involved in dealing with these receipts. And clearly these things are happening all over the world to hundreds and hundreds of people that are all being processed through this system. But this tracking shot actually was only, we only built one side of that room. This side that we're seeing here is just only a couple of the desks are actually dressed. The rest is just covered up. And as we're tracking back now this way, it's the same section that we saw at the first part of the track. We could only build a very small part of the set. In fact, this set is a Victorian flour mill, and all that machinery was wooden flour milling machinery that we then painted gray and added detail to it to make it into a lot of uh, Clark's desks. Um, the set was actually surprisingly cheap. What was difficult in that shot was we were using a wide-angle lens, a 16-millimeter lens, and tracking incredibly quickly. And all of those clerks had to walk within inches of that, of that um, lens as the camera was hurtling backwards and forwards down that track. The screens with their magnifiers on them. I love that. I just, as a kid, I was not even, yeah, as a kid, people used to have these screens you could stick on your television to make them bigger, They're these magnifiers. Or you had also other things you put on to give you blue sky and green ground and flesh tones in the middle. And I love the fact that you've got this machinery where you, they've built small screens that you don't have to magnify them rather than building a big screen. Everything seemed to be being, being done the hard way in this world. Uh, and yet, I think they all prided themselves on what seemed to be a very efficient modern system. Ian Holm was, is great. I mean, I first used him in Time Bandits, and he seldom gets comic parts, and he's a brilliant comedian. Well, what's interesting about his character is that he's this brilliant actor, and he's got a, a vast bag of tricks, but what I felt when we were doing this film is that he was never relying on his normal tricks. He had got himself so insecure, as, as is the character, that he was finding new things that were constantly surprising. He was very nervous. He's, he's normally an incredibly confident actor, but he made himself, in, I think he became sort of an English version of a method actor in his part. Has anybody seen Sam Lowry? These flying sequences, the, the flying man, it's only, the wingspan on that thing is about a, a foot and a half. It's a very small little figure. 
that was uh, hung on four wires and run off a battery that was running on a track. And we shot all of this at about four times, four to five times normal speed. And then that slowed down the movement. The actual uh, puppet as it flew across the sky when we were shooting it was just a blur. You could barely follow it with the camera. It was moving so fast. And then the next day we'd look at the rushes and there would be these graceful, beautiful movements and the wings catching. And we had several ways of doing clouds. We had a background, a painted background of clouds. And then we had cotton clouds in the foreground that were basically made out of stuff called K-Pak, which is used in sleeping bags and, and upholstery. And then we had in front of that, we had tanks with dry ice which we pumped steam through and the combination created boiling cloud-like effects so it was it was several different things that, that managed to create that and the great thing is that when the figure flies through the clouds the wings you can actually see the the, the smoke of the clouds swirling now if we were using you know, blue screen which we intended to do at the start of this film you would never have gotten an effect like that um, the only time we're using blue screen is for the girl in the clouds in the amniotic sack we shot that against the blue screen and then um, superimpose that onto the, the clouds. What? See, the telephone, I loved, see, I loved old switchboards. And so I thought, again, let's make something that combines the, the elements of an old switchboard with supposedly modern technology. So uh, everything is designed for his comfort. He, Sam's got the, the purpose-built flat, unlike other things. You don't see uh, ungainly uh, tubing sticking around or ducting sticking around the place. This is smooth. Everything's hidden behind the walls, like, like the world we live in, generally except none of it works the way it's supposed to. This opening sequence with the, with the uh, toaster and the TV and all that, I'm afraid was then stolen for the opening of Back to the Future by somebody, I don't know, but somebody, I think, nicked it because they had seen this film Brazil at a time before that came out. And I remember a friend calling up and say, have you seen Back to the Future? They've nicked the waking up sequence. Anyway, who's to, we steal from everybody. Jonathan, one of his finest moments to me was this business of picking up the, the soggy toast and making sure we don't see that it's soggy until the moment when he reveals it. He's very clever, brilliant. The, the ministry, what's, several things about this. Uh, I love the idea of you know, nuns. So we got, we got the state, we've got the military, we've got uh, religion all gathered together under a great statue, which is uh, the truth shall make you free. It's the one thing this world doesn't operate on is truth, <laughs> and that they glorify it. Usually you spot how society's working by what they glorify. It's usually the thing they're, they're deficient in. I'll just say something about this set, because we were working at Lee's Studios in, in, in North London, and it's actually a small television studio, and this set is about 100... It was in a studio that was 120 by 80, which is really quite small. And we built it and used very wide-angle lenses to make it look big. But part of the reasons I went to that studio was that invariably, when you make a film like this, everything expands to fill the vacuum. So I wanted to make sure the vacuum was as small as possible so we could stay within budget. And I, I've got a habit of building sets that are smaller than they should be and only usually viewable from one angle. But then we, we solved that problem by using very wide angle lenses to create space, which I think we achieved here really nicely. What's the problem? Problem? No problem. Everything's fine. Wonderful, marvelous. Allison's in great shape. Kids are fine. I'm on security level five now, so Mr. Helpman relies on me more and more. At one point I said I wanted the film to take place everywhere in the 20th century, but I think specifically it was really about, more about the 40s, the late 40s and early 50s when we thought it was all going to get wonderful, you know, that the American way was going to, to lead to a utopia. The costumes in this one tend to be very, very 40-esque. And, uh, I mean, Jonathan does have a certain Jimmy Stewart quality about him. We get aiming for that. Or Stan Laurel, one of the two. Uh, <laughs> Mike, I wanted Mike to play this because Mike is one of the nicest people in the world. And I thought, this is the way your best, he's, he's the perfect best friend. And then by dressing him in black, putting black gloves on him, this is very Gestapo-looking costumes. It plays against Mike's basic nature, and there's always a certain tension in there. I love the fact everywhere something's going on. Everybody's selling something all the time. There's new technology. This new uh, machine is there waiting to solve your problems. As far as paperwork goes, we just... I think even in the original script we had more, but as usual, I overdo it and then cut back in, in, the, in the final cut. The little machine there, I think, was heavily inspired by George Lucas's world. 
it invaded the films and it was invading our consciousness and so I just loved having it there and giving it a personality but a really annoying one and what was lovely is the special effects guys there's one guy working on it and, and we built this thing as if we were building a sculpture and he would find bits and pieces and come up with new ideas and I'd come in and say you know a bit of this a bit of this a bit less of that and we just built this creature um, and I think it's a nice way of working rather than coming in with Say the Sid Mead approach, where you'd get a top designer to design everything down to every detail. Ours was a bit more like found art. It would, it would grow in an organic way with all the members of the team involved in this process. It keeps picking up old films. That can't be. Right. I don't know. I suppose when I approach any film, I start digging up whatever research seems to be applicable. And in the case of Brazil, I mean, we can go back to 1984, the book which I never read. But I think I share in some kind of uh, collective conscious uh, understanding of what 1984 was about, so um, that was there. There was George Gross's paintings, drawings. It, it, Germany entered very largely into this film, Metropolis, Fritz Lang. Totalitarian architecture and, and, and posters became very important. And then you mix all of that with America in the 40s and popular mechanics and the world of uh, everything will be better in the future, you know, technology will solve all our problems. Uh, then there were the films of the, of the 40s, you know, heading down uh, Rio Way, where there was romance, and then sunset beaches, and you mix all that in there. Then you have uh, the reality of Margaret Thatcher's Britain, which we were living in at the time. All those things are part of the process, and so they all go into this big pot, and I, I stir them around, and how they come out, I'm not certain. What we had to do on that face, what was interesting, is the, we, the latex couldn't stretch. Latex doesn't stretch very well. And so that was actually a bit of sleight of hand by Jim Broadbent, who was playing the, the plastic surgeon. He actually has the, all the, the cheeky material in his, in his hands and is unreeling it carefully as, 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 as it seems to be. He's pulling it out. Why is this shot the one that's used all the time? It's just, it actually came from a book on freaks once, and there was a man, a rubber-faced man on the front of this book of freaks, pulling his face out in that ma manner, and I'd seen it somewhere in the 60s or 50s, and it stuck with me, and I finally found a use for it. Plastic surgery again. Every time I come to Los Angeles, I pick up the magazines in the hotel, and half the pages are filled, of, filled with ways of, of chopping and changing your body to be whatever you dream, and... and it fascinates me. It's, it's, it's really, truly American disease. Uh, and again, I loved all this, this stuff, you know, these rubber breasts, and rubber buttocks, rubber everything. It's, uh, it's all about dreams. I mean, that's one of the, the, again, one of the underlying elements in this film is dreams. And, and they're so corrupted, these dreams, is the mother's dreams are totally corrupted. They're all immediate. They're short-term dreams. They're about the now. They're not uh, about anything really enriching. They're totally superficial. And already she's twice as beautiful as she was before. Voila. Mr. Helpman was very close to your poor father. He was very close to me. Still is. The costumes were done by Jim Atchison, and we again started digging around. The shoe hat, which everybody gets excited about, is not our invention. It was there. It was done in the 40s. I can't remember who exactly did it, but we, we just found it in our reference work. There are a lot of very silly hats in this scene. There's a lady with a pork chop hat on her head. There's We just loaded it up with little details like that uh, that you may or may not see. The, this was shot at a place called um, Mentmore Towers, which the Rothschilds owned. And it's a 19th century mansion. And in it, around this area where it's reused for the restaurant, are these huge plate glass windows and doors. They're the largest of their type and the earliest of their type. And they're invaluable. There's no way of replacing them. And we had to do this explosion in that restaurant and, and not let the concussion break these doors and windows. And George Gibbs, who did it, spent ages refining a way of doing something that looked like a huge, massive explosion that actually moved no air. And he succeeded in doing it. It's, it's very impressive work, basically. Oh How are you? You look Mrs. Train, everything about her is feminine, but she's totally unfeminine. She's just the, one of the least appealing women in the film. Um, Shirley with her brace, again, I love what people would do to their children, <laughs> humiliate them publicly. I grew up with people with braces all the time. 
And it makes a great character. I mean, to have a grown, a grown woman walking around like that. And strangely, again, life imitates art because my sister, when she was 40-something, got her teeth done. So it goes on and on. I love the fact you know, that food is chosen by picture and number. And the minute Sam breaks that rule, it's, it's, it's such a, a cockeyed place. I remember American restaurants were doing that after I'd moved to England and came back. They spent all their time, you read the menu, and you, the first half of the menu is about the ambience in which you're eating. And everything is pretending to be sophisticated and cultured, and you've got to wear ties and jackets. And yet the food is rubbish. It's, it's, the, it's just rubbish. And so this was my reaction to all of those things, the times I'd been thrown out of restaurants because I wasn't dressed properly, and yet I knew the food was going to be used to so, um, it's all those things that are done to humiliate you in the name of sophistication and culture, but the reality is still this, these blobs of food that are only identified by these photographs that bear no resemblance to what you're, you're, you're eating. Jim's costumes are quite wonderful. I mean, I love Mother with her leopard and her red hair and Mrs. Terrain and all her fr frou-frou. Or Spyro takes the dog and pops it under the, the silver salver and they walk off. And some people don't even see that, but that was one of those things in the scene. We got this dog, how do we get rid of it? Okay, boom, and on the day we decide that. Um, what I love about Mrs. Terrain is no matter what happens to her, no matter how bad it goes, she believes in the man so much, she puts up with all this pain, agony, and ultimately death. And that's part of the great American spirit. The, Whatever is going on, you believe in the top. It's kind of inspired by my parents, uh, who were just ordinary people. My dad was a carpenter, my mother was a housewife, and they put such faith in doctors and lawyers and all the professional people. They never questioned them, they only believed in them. And, and it's always bothered me that, and so we managed to include it in the film. I love the idea that no matter what goes on, no matter how bad the bombings, how much human carnage is around there, people get on with their lives. This was really as a result of the IRA bombings in London, which we got used to very easily. Life would go on. A bombing would occur, and the next day the restaurant would open, and life would go on. And there's, I mean, people were accused me of, of being insensitive. Maybe it's just in that kind of world the only way you can survive is to, you've got to ignore, you cut out great chunks of the awfulness that go, goes on, and you just concentrate on the little details. Uh, like gifts for executives, you ignore it. Gynecological examination, including cesarean section. This idea of plastic surgery uh, in its different forms actually was inspired by, by my father, who had uh, some kind of growth on his ear once and went to an acid man, a man who used acid to etch away the nasty little bits. And it could be done in his uh, clinic without any uh, general anesthetic or even local anesthetic, and what happened is they put this acid on his ears, put a, uh, a bandage over it, and then sent him and my mother out into the park across from his clinic to wait an hour while it did its business. And he came back in, and my dad was in extreme pain through this whole thing. He pulled the bandage off, and it had actually eaten his ear. And he then had to have his ear reconstructed by a proper a knife man as opposed to an acid man. And so this was a thing that has stayed with me a long time, and I've got it a great hatred of plastic surgeons, and this is my chance to nail them. Of course you want something. You must have hopes, wishes, dreams. No, nothing. Not even dreams. Now, in an earlier cut, we didn't have that line in there because we thought we were hitting it too much on the nose. But after screening it, we realized the film is so dense in detail that we had to nail things right on the nose. No subtlety in a lot of instances because it was the only guide that people could hold on to as they were going through this, this overly elaborate labyrinth. We built a model landscape that's probably about 30 feet across and about 20 feet deep. And then we had these great hydraulic rams that pushed up these very heavy plaster with steel framed uh, monoliths. We only had, I think, three out of the ground, and, and so we kept shooting it again and again in different, in different speeds and different angles. And some of it was just amazing. Again, when you're you, working with models like that and you've got all that earth, it's surprising what happens. And, you, and there's a moment here at this shot where it's falling. And I actually, every time I see this part of the film, my stomach sort of goes. I'm falling and because it seems to be going up and yet it's going down. It's, and you're caught in it. And it was just pure chance that it happened. And 
I found that I've, I've always found that in the films that that these kind of mistakes or just flaws in the system produce the moment that seems the most lifelike. Maybe this says something about our lives <laughs> that the only that uh, human life is a flawed process. His life, there's no, there's no escape from the real world. That's what I find extraordinary. No matter what he does, what he doesn't do, it's all there pushing at him. Uh, I find more and more people keep coming up and telling me that Brazil was before its time and it's uh, now all coming true. I disagree with them because it was all there, just people weren't looking at it in, in quite the way I was seeing it. One of my happiest moments is the idea that this recorded voice says this is not a recording and then starts repeating itself. I love the idea of the human touch. Wherever you went there, the world was turned inside out, upside down and backwards. Everything is happy and positive. Wow, and gosh. And, and, and I was on the phone the other day and, uh, and this very chirpy voice keeps asking you, if you want that one or that one, why not push this button? If you don't, push that button. And at the end, they tried so hard to make it human and happy and positive. And I wanted to hear at the end of it, this has not been a recording. Have a happy day. <laughs> uh, one of the things that's interesting about this scene, it was the first day we shot with De Niro and... He, I think he was very nervous because it was the first time he'd done a bit part in a film, always before he'd been carrying the film. And it's much harder sometimes to walk into a production that's been working for a couple months and everybody's feeling comfortable with one another and to try to walk into this thing and be an actor when you know that everybody's expecting you to be Robert De Niro, the world's greatest actor. And that's a terrible pressure to put on anybody. And he was very nervous. And what was interesting is Jonathan does this preamble of being asleep in the refrigerator, waking up, banging his head, falling over, you know, putting his hand down the garbage disposal, dragging the phone down, this very complicated preamble. And then finally hearing this voice on the phone saying, put your hands up and the phone down. And Bob was so nervous the first time he did it. He fluffed his lines and, and, and he said, can we start again? And Jonathan starts up, does the big preamble. Bob fluffs him again. He said, it doesn't matter, Bob, we don't see your face. And not only do we not see his face, but we see it's covered with his balaclava helmet. And, and I think the whole thing was just getting more and more bizarre because eventually at one point he said, uh, Mr. Lowry, put the phone up and your hands down. Oh, shit, Terry, can we do it again? He said, keep going, Bob, it doesn't matter. We can't see anything, we can fix it later. And that was, that was our first day with, with De Niro, who I think does one of the great performances in here. It's, it's one of the times he was really relaxed and really funny. He's got, he's got such a presence on, on screen that it always astounds me when, when we're working with Bob you're doing the shots and you can't see anything happening and you look at the rushes the next day and wow it's all going on interestingly enough when I first gave the script to De Niro I said pick any part you want to play and he actually chose the Jack Lind part and I said oh sorry because obviously he's a more complex character and I said no I've already given that to Mike Palin I was hoping you would play uh, Tuttle and he didn't he wasn't comfortable with that and I think because it's such a sort of you know John Wayne kind of part it's a much more two-dimensional character than the other, which is a much more complex, neurotic character. And I said, but you're a hero, Bob. You're a hero to all of us. You, know, even, you may not think you're that, but you are to us, and that's why you've got to play this part. And we talked him into it. And, and then we started explaining that you know, he's his technician, and he's, he's a plumber, but he does it with the precision of a surgeon. And he, again, took this to its logical conclusion. He had a friend who was a neurosurgeon in New York and started hanging around the operating theater to learn the tricks. He's... Uh, it's extraordinary when you when you take on De Niro, you're taking on somebody who won't let go of any moment. He has to everything has to be worked out, and it's 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 absolutely extraordinary. And then having done all that research, then we pl start playing, and and he's brilliant at it. Uh, I think what was interesting at the end, the first time I showed this film, to, there's a couple of journalists who saw it before we put the credits on, and they didn't. And I said, "What do you think of De Niro?" At the end of the film, and they said, "What? What do you mean, De Niro?" He's not in the film. I said, yes, he is. And they hadn't recognized Harry Tuttle as Bob De Niro, which I thought was, that was very impressive. <laughs> and he's, he spent several months preparing for this thing, getting the costume right. It was just if, if we had a complete other film unit working on just the part of Tuttle, getting just the right um, uh, set of, uh, of, of uh, equipment and tools. Uh, he came up with the, the silly glasses. That was his idea. And it was just a wonderful moment. And we, 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 we'd seen these glasses with lights on them. We thought, wouldn't it be great to put the really thick lenses on? So that's totally his idea. 
something about ducks. When people saw the film, they all talked about ducks afterwards. And to me, it, was, it wasn't such a surprising thing because we don't seem to see how we get all the goodies that modern society provides for us. And, and in England, what always used to strike me was seeing beautiful Regency buildings or Victorian buildings that the outside had been fouled by all the plumbing that, um, that had been added to the houses after they had b been built. And so these beautiful uh, cornices and detail was violated by this, these ugly pipes which were providing the things that people wanted, i.e. better plumbing, ways of getting rid of the shit. And I thought that kind of brutality to the aesthetics of the society was, was rather important. So this is where the ducks began for, for Brazil. The flashlight. Then we come to Spore and Dowser. These are the guys who are the system who can't make it work, who are inefficient, who are threatened by people who are efficient. And, uh, and I got Bob, because I'd known Bob for years, and, and Derek O'Connor uh, was in Jabberwocky the first time, and, and he's a great actor, and he just, we, we dragged, and he's then in Time Bandits, and uh, we put them together. And that morning, they started changing the parts because Derek used to have lines, and we just started taking his lines away. He liked the idea of being an echo of Bob, everything that Bob said he would echo. And they became this ridiculous double act. And it was sort of late in the afternoon when we started, they finally make their entrance. And I think they were both, they both had a good, a good liquid lunch. And it was a really funny, funny day we had. We had a great time. Bob's a brilliant actor, and he's brilliantly funny, and he's dangerous at the same time. That's, that's that nice quality of being very dangerous feeling and yet being very funny. We played it that way, the whole thing. He's a great threat. He's a, I like, you don't see that very often when you've got really great comic characters, but they're threatening. They're really threatening. They're like Tweedledum and Tweedledee, but, but they've got, a, uh, you know, they've got a, uh, a gun in their hands. <laughs> um. Fix it. Thanks for coming. We'll be back, you clever little bastard. Thank you. I can show you. Thanks, Lowry. You're a good man in a tight corner. De Niro and his Hitler mustache, I don't know where it came from, but we, these things kind of grow. And I loved, you know, we started pumping this thing inside, all that machinery in there. And I loved, I wanted it to be like the guts, real guts. I tried to make the thing organic. The world, one level, the world is totally non-organic, inhuman. And, and yet the minute you scrape away the surface, it's bleeding and it's throbbing and it's, it's, it's breathing like an animal. And, and a great fun with the special effects in there. We've got a lion roar. We've got all sorts of strange animal noises in amongst all of that. There's some people that criticize the character of Sam of not being heroic or macho enough, and I think they get it all wrong. The point is, he's a little man, he's a little Clark, and he's, he's got dreams, but he's, he's a geek, he's a nerd. Uh, and I've had friends criticize the film for that, and I think they're absolutely wrong. I love the fact that he's as weedy as he is uh, at the beginning. Jonathan in here, I think, is Clark, and he's is, is brilliantly funny. He had an idea, which was when it came to pay De Niro, he keeps his money in a little tin inside the microwave. There's something so childish and pathetic about that. And it's clear he doesn't, he's not comfortable at tipping people, unlike his mother who could walk into any room, drop a note here to somebody, you know, five or there, ten, and get anything she wants. He's got his money, and he's really, it's, it's all so tiny and pathetic. And I love that. And it doesn't mean that Jonathan in real life is mean and ungenerous, but I think he tapped in something there that he, he knew well. <laughs> We built a set that was about 15 feet high, a model set. And I looked down and realized it still didn't seem deep enough. And basically, I, I got a piece of two pieces of cardboard that were the color of the walls and laid them at the bottom, and they carry the line of the building down. And it makes the building look twice as high as it really is with two pieces of cardboard about a foot square. And the traffic below were just tiny little fairy lights that were just on strings that we were pulling along the black velvet ground. <laughs> The check to me was a really important idea. The idea that really seemed to me indicative of everything about the mentality here because 
we get in a situation which is embarrassing because it's a piece of paperwork that can't be got rid of. It's an actual piece of, you know, a check for $12 or whatever is money. And I, this this actually came out of the whole idea of, of torturing people and charging them for that came out of a, a 16th century document that I found once, which was uh, during the witch trials in Europe. And they actually had a sheet which delineated all the different charges for each torture, depending on what they did to you. There was a charge. And that was a simple fact. And you know, each fingernail they pulled out, that cost you. It cost you. It didn't cost them. Because it was they were doing the work. You were just sitting there. And if you were found guilty, your estate, when you died, was then charged all this money. You were charged for the number of uh, weeks you were incarcerated. You were charged for the bundles of faggots that were used in your burning. And at the end of the whole thing, you had to pay for a banquet for the court that found you guilty. So this was extraordinary stuff. And what was amazing was then I found it was happening in South America only a few years ago, and I think even still now, they were charging people for their incarceration. And I thought, this is extraordinary. So that was really important to try to, to work out here, you know, that everything was done. And again, it was all done for the best of possible reasons. It was a very Thatcherite way of thinking, that these people are causing trouble. These are the people who are threatening society. And if they're found guilty, why should decent law-abiding citizens pay for this and all the things that went into finding them guilty? Why shouldn't they be forced to pay? And that seems very reasonable. It seems absolutely fair. And that's what we were trying to deal with here. And then for Sam, to think he's doing a good deed, the idea of it being Christmas, and the idea of him doing a good deed by taking this check, which was an overcharge in the process of killing somebody, to take that check out to the woman. It, it shows just how twisted his version and everybody's version of the world is. He, can't, he actually does feel he's doing the best thing. Nobody else would do that. Everybody else is hiding in their, in their bureaucratic little uh, uh, termite mountains. And he's going out there to do a good deed. Uh, the idea that in the, the, the universal version, to remove the fact that he's aware that Buttle is dead, indicated his you know, callousness and would turn the audience's sympathies away from our character, is just so wrong because he's innocent. He's not a bad guy. It's not about him. It's about the state of the world, that people have come to that position that they, you know, they can't see what's wrong with that. And I don't think that's far off from where a lot of people find themselves now. You know, when, when they criticize that part of the film, they're missing the point, because he actually is doing, in the terms of that world, a good and daring deed. He's behaving like a hero. He's doing two things. He's cutting through the complexity of the bureaucracy and going out to show the human side, or the humane side, the humane face of these great organizations. She doesn't have a bank account. Well, that's it then. I might just as well go and hang myself now. <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea of Casablanca and play it against Sam, um, all that, was th that came from Tom. He had that in there, and I love that. It's just, it's you know, the most romantic film we know, basically. And there it was, and somehow playing in the background of that whole scene, that music. I love that because a lot of people in the audience don't even notice it, but anybody who does care about films in Casablanca, when you, the minute you hear those first few, few notes of the music, you know what's going on out there, you know that all the Clarks are watching it. And maybe 90% maybe of the people watching it don't understand those references, but for the 10, it enriches the whole thing. I just feel I like creating echoes within echoes. Everything is re referring to other things. And if you don't get it, fine. What, what I really like are the, the people who s start getting it and then want to find more, and they start digging, and they discover. And so it's like sort of an archaeological dig the film can be. Do you know, I think I've broken a bone. Look, my wrist is all limp. What a pathetic creature I am. And what's wonderful is how Ian Holm, this little thing about his wrist going all in, the way he's playing that, it's... He's avoiding, he's avoiding, he knows somehow, on, where Sam doesn't, he knows that the less he gets his fingerprints on this material, what, he lets Sam forge his name. He does all these things because he, he knows, probably he doesn't even, I don't know if he knows it consciously, but he knows it subconsciously. These are the things you, you duck out of and let it go on to somebody else, let somebody else get involved in this hot potato. Mm -hmm. Bob. 
good to me, you know. He's looking at you, kid. He's looking at you. <laughs> I'd always been fascinated by Messerschmitts. And they were these little three-wheeled cars that were built. Uh, and I wanted them in, in the film. I wanted to use it somehow. And we found a club, a club that actually uses them and rebuilds them uh, in England. And we, we added a few bits and pieces to make it a little bit more modern. But again, it ties in with this sort of German expressionist film. It's a German film, a German car. It ties in. Everything's tying in somehow. It's both you know, very modern and very ancient and totally unique. That's what I love about it. I love the ha happiness, we're all in it together line because it then pays off very nicely when Spore and Dowser get their comeuppance. There's a little sign in the background that nobody notices. It's called, this place is called Shangri-La Towers. And we've got a bit of graffiti in the back, changing the grilla into gorilla. Shangri-La Towers, nobody notices it. Uh, posters figure very largely in this world because there's a way of constantly throwing in ideas without having to slow down the, the, the narrative flow. I love the top security holiday camps. People, you know, can read all of this. There is a world that's being presented in a poster. We don't have to build those things. It's all there. And it's making comments while we're doing this scene about the kids playing. They're, they're, they're reenacting the very events that have that sort of framed their lives because these things are clearly going on around them all the time. People being arrested. And rather than running from it, they're playing with those things. And you can say they're being brutalized, or maybe they're not being brutalized. This is maybe the way they can deal with it and survive it, by turning the reality into a game. Now, we've got these characters. Again, I wanted to plant them around this world. They were always spies somewhere. And they, they're half seen. They're usually not totally clear. Now, this, the bottle flat was just... A sad, strange place. I loved the feeling that you know life had gone out of it, where it had been a happy, Christmassy place. Now there's the boys sort of lurking in the distance, nobody's saying anything. The mother has clearly been staring out that window since her husband was arrested. She's gone practically catatonic. And coming from all the noise and bustle of everything before, to come into this very still world where I think Jonathan, I actually, this scene is to me, is. Uh, like a turning point scene is so crucial because it's the first time he comes out of his bureaucratic cocoon where he has, actually has to deal with the real world, not deal it through his fantasies or his protected status, but he actually has to come and see the results of the handiwork. And I think he's been spending most of his life avoiding the sense of doing anything important within the system, so he's not responsible for any of it. I think there's a side of him that's always underneath he knows what the system is doing and is avoiding responsibility by staying low in the in the bureaucratic totem pole but here he comes out thinking he's doing a good deed and confronts a woman who you know there's nothing there's just silence and Jonathan is brilliant here he just I think it's one of his best scenes because he's got to play against this wall of of, 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 of nothingness of just pure misery. He tap dances, he tries to laugh, he tries to make it somehow bearable, and it's unbearable. There's no excuse for this. And I think ultimately his most awful line is, I didn't have to come here, I didn't have to do this, uh, as a way of kind of absolving himself that he was doing a good deed and it's not being appreciated. And eradicating any error, but if you do have any complaints you wish to make, I'd be well, only too happy to send you the appropriate forms. What have you done with his body? And Charles McEwen about what have you done with his body, which again is such a, it's such an awful line. It's just, it's not, it's not beating around the bush. It's saying the words that you don't say. It's things like that. Not even referring to him as her husband anymore. It's a body, and she just wants the body back. Some kind of proof of what happened, who he was, whatever. It's all been taken away from her, and. Uh, and this scene was really, it was really hard. It was the first time we've ever done, I felt, a really emotional scene in any film we've ever been in. And it was, at the end of it, it's really hard not to see the whole crew crying because it was so painful. And, uh, and anything that, in the idea of, of cutting out his knowledge of the Bottle Tuttle or the, of Bottle's death, it's just wrong. It just takes everything. It just cuts the scene off at the ankles. He is guilty, and he just it now has to face his part of the guilt in what's happened here. Um, 
And I love it going from this very calm scene to this just frenzy of activity when the boy, the boy, atta boy attacks. And then Jill in the mirrors. I mean, everything is mirrors, and, and nothing is, nothing is quite tangible. It's all just slipping away. It's it's always in reflection or not. When Sam is running up the stairs to Jill's apartment, this lurker, lurker spy, comes running down and they bang into each other. And so that's my Hitchcockian appearance in this film. Good God, look at that, that's acting. <laughs> Again, Jonathan, as a physical actor, is extraordinary what he's doing in, it, in these things. The way he uses his body, the way he stumbles, falls. And there he is, I mean, here's a guy, he's pursuing his dream. He doesn't know what to do in that, so he just runs away from it. <laughs> One Messerschmitt was designed to be sacrificed all along. <laughs> uh, the fact is I didn't want to place it in a specific time or even a place. I also said not only does it play, take place everywhere in the 20th century, but it takes place on the Los Angeles-Belfast border. You know, these places don't exist, but they are, and that's the simple fact. And I wanted to keep it non-specific because, and, yet, and that's what's so terrifying of the time we're living in. And maybe it's just that people don't know anymore. People are so confused and frightened. They're trying to define everything all the time, trying to pin it down, nail it, confine it, control it, because the, everything's out of control, clearly. And so they, they do that. And, and I just, in my perverse way, want to go against that. And this, this, this truck was, again, I think, probably inspired by Steven Spielberg's duel. He made the first really good truck. <laughs> the whole thing is pathetic. I mean, the, the fact to have a car that size and to be able to put a mattress on it, I just love. The kids are just playing. I mean, this guy is you know, a government official, and they're just giving him as miserable a time as possible. One thing that I never have been certain in, in, in the scene is whether people recognize the girl as little girl bottle, because we put this great strawberry birthmark on her face to make her easily recognizable. And in, in the shooting of it, I don't think we ever got the light right on her face. And I don't think we see it, what it is. Uh, people seem to understand instinctively that it's the daughter, I think. But it was one of those moments that I felt we didn't get on film information that was as clear as it should be. The script originally was it was a more complex relationship between Sam and Jill. It, in many ways, it was like two halves of a whole personality, uh, where Sam was timid and, and lived in his dream world and, and ran from the world through fantasy. She was the opposite. She was actually also running from the world, but doing it by not working in offices, by taking this this job as a truck driver where she could be free to be in her ca free in her cab away doing whatever she did. Uh, and she was really the strong character, and both of them were vulnerable and, and protected their vulnerability in different ways. And it was only that his almost childishness at times, and his, his, I suppose his innocence in a strange way, broke through this shell of hers, which was she had cut herself off from people and humanity and was you know, frightened of what the world was. And, and together they became kind of a whole person. But in the course of making it, the part of Jill got smaller and smaller, and she became now as almost a figment of his imagination all the time. It, it makes Sam the total focus of the film. It's all about him and his uh, perception of the world. And, and at the time, I was a bit disappointed to lose this idea of her as uh, the other half of his personality. So together, together they blossomed. And that seemed a great loss at the time. Now when I look at the film, I don't know. I don't know if there was room for that, frankly. And... Uh, when you're editing the film, we, I mean, it, it is a long film, and it's a very intense film, and you keep trying to trim it down, and often you make mistakes. I just find when you read books about you know, great film directors, how they always are supposed to know everything all the time and make all the right choices, I don't believe that. I think, I think the process is one where you're, you're finding your way through the material, and depending on your mood, your, your sense of security or lack of it at any moment, you make choices, and some of them are more right than others. Oh, I don't know. I don't know why. The advantage of having you know, like VHS or, or laser discs now is you can play with it again and again and, and miss the bits you missed. You can and hopefully find because in the in the the cage going home. I mean, they travel in cages all the time and everything. 
people are caged in different ways. We've got all these men sitting there. There's only one woman in the place, and she's standing. Now, you would thought that was bad enough, but she's not just a woman standing. She's a pregnant woman standing, and she's a pregnant woman, when you look closely enough, that has only one leg. And with all of that going, the men are still there sitting. And I, where we are now, people have uh, no longer um, behave in a gracious way towards women. Women are now free from all of that. They don't have to uh, cloaks thrown over mud puddles for them. They're, they can stand on their own two feet. And we've now got one pregnant and standing on her one foot. Uh, we had a, uh, a forklift truck that we had Jonathan uh, hung off of these flying sequence. These, these models were about 15 feet high, 12 to 15 feet high, and uh, there's tiny little puppets down there pulling along. And I, 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 I mean, I love all this stuff. I love uh, the idea of floating cages. There's something that's all, everything is reversed upside down. The uh, one thing that's interesting is the shafts of light in some of these sequences, rather than uh, lighting them, we actually had strips of translucent material, white material, that we just cut the shafts of light from and, and hung there. The um, forces of darkness were strange things to me, because on one hand, they were babies, and on the other hand, they were skeletal, and then at the same time, they were kind of reptilian. They were both life and death. And I had this feel, I always had this image of a woman in a cage, trapped, being pulled by both you know, babies and death, maybe it signified marriage to me in a strange way. This is why I'm not certain whether these are analyzable on a Freudian level or not, because I don't recognize most of these images as meaning something. Now, that means maybe I've repressed these things so much, they're so deep, but on the other hand, I think a lot of them are just cute ideas that I've had <laughs> that I think are ironic or funny. I don't know, this could either be a sign, a pro-feminist statement, or, or not, as, as the case may be. Yeah, I think what I hate is seeing inefficiency masquerading as, as order and the way things should be. And the idea of this... Sam's flat being gutted like that. I mean, it really, it's like we're in an abattoir where uh, these guys are just ripping this thing. And, and that looks to me like a living, breathing creature there, that they're fumbling about in its innards. Maybe this is part of my obsession with doctors again. Maybe we're back in the world of surgery here with people being opened up by inefficient uh, surgeons. Uh, I, I mean, I, the, the likelihood of finding this offending piece of technology in the midst of that is so, so ridiculous. But it is fun. And those silly hats. I've always hated baseball hats, and this was our chance to push them as far as we could. It looked like this terrible duck bill. And it's stupid, and I still think those hats are stupid, and they've taken over America. Everybody wears them now. <laughs> Again, it's something like your flat. When you're flat, that's the one place that Sam has. It's, it's his cave, it's his inner sanctum, the place he's safe, where he can dream these blissful dreams. And now we've violated it, we've ripped it apart. We've, there's no, the real world has now entered his world, and there's no escape. I never know. I think sometimes I overload the soundtrack sometimes, and it makes it unnecessarily difficult to listen to because I like all the textures of the noise of a room and I like, invariably keep adding more and more layers to every film I do and uh, and sometimes I overdo it. I, I'm never certain about it. It's, it's, it's vital that you hear the dialogue clearly but on the other hand there's a, there's a place with a din going on and you need to include that in it. I've never quite worked out how you do these things properly. <laughs> The thing with Sam's dreams at the beginning, they're very much Hollywood kind of dreams. They're Superman dreams, you know. He's the all-powerful one, there's the dark forces, there's the beautiful girl, I rescue. It's really simplistic Hollywood macho male fantasies, in a sense. And what's interesting, in the course of the thing, his final dream isn't that. It's, it's a very domestic fantasy, in a sense. He does kind of really fall in love. It's a gentle thing. He's the one that's being taken away by her to this beautiful valley, which isn't about, you know, hacking away at demons and saving the world. It's, it's, it's just, their escapes in different ways. One is one that's, I think, more in touch with, hopefully, what life could be. And the other is Hollywood's version of what life should be, and especially for young men.
Now, the samurai was an interesting thing, because I saw a, a samurai mask on the front of the Radio Times in London, and it was made out of computer parts. I've always wanted to, being a Kurosawa fan, wanted to have a samurai warrior somewhere in my films. And so we made this one out of computer bits and pieces. And maybe, you know, after the event, I started thinking, well, maybe it's symbolic of one sphere of Japanese technology, that it's this monster that's been created that is now dominating. It's there. Um, I'm not sure about it. I think I just wanted to have a samurai warrior. But uh, we, we end up with really, really bizarre rationale for these things because at the moment when he uh, lifts off the mask and we see it's Sam himself, you could actually argue that samurai means Sam, you are I. <laughs> Pathetic stuff. When we shot this sequence, uh, we used a boy for the wide shots, because Winston Dennis, who was uh, in Munchausen, um, play, was inside the samurai outfit, and he was big, but not big enough, and so we got this little boy who worked perfectly in the wide shots. We made a miniature armor and did the whole number, and I was quite surprised how close we could get to him without giving the game away. The armor we did and the wing stuff was based on a, there's a Viennese painter called Fuchs, He's a uh, contemporary painter, and he, he paints these angels that are strange, metallic, and yet translucent things. And this is what we were trying to do with that costume. He's kind of a Perseus uh, figure. And again, it's like it's sort of pre-Batman with all the muscles built in. So it, it makes this weedy-looking Clark look like a great muscle, muscled character. That shot of him, Sam running forward reminded me of my days as a pole vaulter in high school. <laughs> this is how we used to do it. It was actually very dangerous stuff to have that kind of flame coming out of a man inside a suit. Again, George Gibbs did a wonderful job. And to try to get it red flame. This, I discovered, is a, is a hard thing, which uh, quite a lot of uh, alchemy to create. The, the, the gas supply came out of his leg on tubes, so there's somebody off stage that could always turn it off if there was any problem. It's very dangerous when you're playing with fire. You've got to plan everything very carefully. And again, I'm always worried on a set because on one hand, there's this terrible pressure invariably to get the shot. We've got to keep moving. On the other hand, you've got to be careful and be safe. And, and when you step over that boundary, you have accidents usually. So I, I, I don't know, I try to try to be careful, but still I lose my temper and say, come on, we gotta get this shot now! <laughs> the telegram lady is just pure silliness. There's no excuse for this. But I couldn't, I thought it was so nice to come out of a very heavy dream sequence that was terrifying in the midst of this, this destroyed flat and have somebody like this. And it was the time when singing telegrams were really turning up everywhere in, in every form possible. And again, I love it. It's like the old Philip Morris uh, call for Philip Morris commercial, which was very big in the 40s. Um, and the idea of a singing telegram that just makes just basically no sense. And the fact that Sam thinks he has to reply in the same style is just funny. And Jonathan is brilliant. It used to, the sequence actually used to go on longer because she starts twitching here, you may notice. And, um, and in fact, is she has to go to the toilet. And so... Uh, it, it went on and on, but we chopped it. <laughs> we shortened it because I thought we had done enough. No, at one point, because the lyrics were so hard to understand, we were going to subtitle it. I, I sometimes think we ought to have done it because all through this, I kept thinking, we're going too far, we're going too far, we've got to keep this thing under control. And I, the reality is we had stepped over the line long ago. We should have just gone with whatever came to mind, I think. The, uh, this, that strange shot of going up the stairs is a very weird one because... We, down at the bottom, the door opens. You see a figure walk in, and it, you know it's Sam. It's got to be Sam walking in. And then we tip up, and you reveal I, reveal that he's in fact halfway up the stairs. And at every every turn is a shock. I mean, to walk up those stairs from his apartment, which seems to be a moderate, and suddenly you're surrounded by flunkies in lace and wigs, is is just what is going on here? And that's that's strong enough. And then you turn around, and you discover the mother has lost uh, several years, and to not even recognize your own mother 
strikes me as an intriguing proposition. Godmother, is that you? Of course, isn't it wonderful? But it, because it was so mad, I kept always trying to make sure there was a logic. It was clear that we weren't breaking a mood. The world is clearly so twisted from the norm that everything is possible. And yet, all the time, I just felt we had to hold on to kind of rules. Now, the rules may have made sense to me then. They may not always make sense to me now. But you've, you've got to do that. Otherwise, if everything is possible, there's no tension. There's got to be something you're fighting against. Catherine Hellman and I first worked together in Time Bandits, and I was a great fan of Soap, but I just thought Catherine was one of the great ones. And when we did this, Catherine came up with the idea of Catherine as the mother. It was just wonderful, and she doesn't do anything wrong. And what's so wonderful, she's totally brave. She has no worries about doing anything. <laughs> no matter how successful she's become, she's never grand. She loves playing and trying dangerous things. Jim Broadbent, who plays the uh, plastic surgeon, now turns up in everything. Jim's one, just a great, great actor. Mike Lee is using him all the time in his films. We made him almost plastic, his skin, and we made him like this plastic creature. He's done so much work on himself as well as others. That, uh, <laughs> I love the idea of Jack Purvis as the other plastic surgeon, the idea that you put your health in the hands of a man who already has got so many marks against him is pretty strange. <laughs> These are desperate times. Mrs. Terrain, I, I, I love people like that. I love people that no matter what happens to them, they keep going on. They're, they're, I think they're, they're probably the fodder that keeps America going. They're always there. They're willing to spend money on whatever the new solution to things are. No matter how bad it gets, they, they never lose faith. Nothing to worry about. He's promised me these bandages will be... The mother's flight is so different than everything we've seen before. We actually updated a lot of things. We updated the costumes in this one. Where before, we were pretty much in the 40s. This is much more 50s. We're moving up in time. The interesting thing about making a film is when you, you start, you've got a script, and I've got very precise ideas in my mind about the characters, who they are, and then you get the actors, and then things start really coming alive, and that's what's nice about it, because I know I keep hearing other directors who, you know, have very, just totally dominate the actors, and I don't know how to do that. I don't want to do that, because I think if you hire the right person for the part, they will then bring to that character a lot of ideas that I haven't thought of, and, and they'll enrich it. So that's the way I like working, and so when... Um, People like Catherine Podgson, who plays uh, Shirley, um, we put the brace on her. I mean, she was just extraordinary because it's, it's sort of a non-part, and she made it into this wonderfully funny thing. And there was that moment when, as Jonathan's leaving, he steps on her foot again at the party, and she does that wonderful range of, of reactions. And that was, again, just she did it, and the camera kept rolling. And so Jonathan constantly added to it. I think at every every scene he made new and funny things. He made it funnier than it was in many cases. He's a great comic performance. He made it physically more surprising because he's a wonderful mover. Remember how they used to stick out? What? Oh, yes. It's, it's, uh, his eye acting is just breathtaking. What, my ears? <laughs> Gasping. Dr. Jaffe pins our ears back. It's one of the great moments. Oh, I was just wondering if you were falsies. And a lot of people, <laughs> people, it, it's like, and, and because I wasn't certain about it, I had to keep it moving. So the minute, if it didn't work, we had oh, Mr. Helpman, and we're out of the thing. Into it. Um, there's no, all of this scene, Mr. Helpman I love is a man, his name is Helpman, and yet he's the one that needs, he provides help, but he needs help. He's in a wheelchair. There's something about, a, maybe it's my, my days with FDR, that I was the leader in a wheelchair. There's something about the crippled leader. There's very, it's a very strong image. I need your help. And Peter Vaughn, again, was in Time Bandits as the ogre. And Peter, from the first time I saw him in Straw Dogs, I knew this is somebody I wanted to work with. He's just one of these great actors. And we gave him this Bismarckian haircut, to, uh, again, more of the Germanic elements. One of the things about Mr. Helpman is he's 
um, the vice minister, the, the assistant minister. There's no real minister in this film. Maybe maybe nobody is in charge is what we were implying by the fact that uh, there's never any mention of anybody above him, and yet he's clearly, his title says he's second in command. Especially after the bombing. And I keep his name alive at the office every day. It's as though he's there still speaking to me. Here I am. J.H. The, the idea of here I am, J.H., the, the anagram of Jeremiah, is a typical Tom Stoppard. I don't know how Tom does it. I don't know how his mind works, how he can, number one, choose a name like Jeremiah, of all names, and then make an anagram which is based on a Cockney pronunciation. Here I am, not here I am, here I am, J.H. It's... That's the way Tom's mind works. It is bre breathtakingly wonderful when you see that. I mean, I think the use of something like Ghost in the Machine, which you know can be seen as a cliche, is really it is a cliche. But that's what's interesting about it. It has more meaning than just a cliche. So some could say, oh, it's just that's all it is. It's obvious and superficial. On the other hand, it does resonate through the thing. I don't care how many ways we lead people down these paths, whatever sparks it off, as long as we start them on paths of discovery. And that's it. That's interesting. The world of shadows. I love shadows. This is the same set, basically, we used for the first part of the ministry. We just cleaned it out, we relit it, we changed a few things. And it's a way of saving money. You alter things and you keep reusing them. Um, but it's when you're working and you're designing things, it's nice to give things reasons. And, and they're not just a pretty set. It's not just an expensive room. The room has got to have a meaning. It's got to be a character. It's saying things. Um, and this time, rather than the bustle and the public face of the ministry, which was the first time we uh, went into the other, when we went into the other foyer, this is the real face of the place, and it's big, and it's calm and still, and uh, and it has no fear. There are no guards. There are nothing. It has no fear. It knows everything. It knows who Sam is without him. Uh, bringing out his identification. I love things like we, the way we brought the lift. It all is coming and everything is like, this is under control. Where before we were in the Clark's Pool where we could see it was fraught with inefficiency and stupidity. Now we know we're moving into the area where the heart of the place and it's, it's all under control until the lift rises up and it almost reaches the floor. <laughs> and then we know, oops. <laughs> Nothing quite works, no matter what you do. I love that moment. It really always makes me laugh. And again, Jonathan, there's something about the movement of all that. You, it's, it's just joke telling is all this is really done in a very uh, broad, big way. Now, what was interesting in this, this we were back in our, uh, down at our flour mill. And these, those holes you see in the ceiling are the bottom of huge grain silos. And we built the walls with the doors in there. And then at the end, it's a painted perspective that goes on. We only built this one corridor. And we then use whip pans. So when Jonathan now looks across, we whip across, and we whip across to the same corridor. What's interesting about a whip pan, once you move the camera in a fast movement, it blurs everything. And then you just pick up and blur it into the next shot. And so all we have is this one corridor, which is used again and again and again for reverses, uh, whip pans, and I love the idea of this uh, of this mob of people. You can't quite make out, ru bustling, rustling, bustling. It's, we got a choreographer to work with us on this because I wanted it to have almost dance-like qualities. It's almost like an old Hollywood musical where people were working in the city room or something, and it was done in that in that flurry of activity. But the idea, what I liked, is is the total. Uh, bareness of the place. There's no sign of life anywhere uh, except for this one pocket of bustling, swilling, swirling humanity. Uh, and they're all, they're all these desperate people. And, and again, that sense that Ian Richardson is a man, he's a decision maker here. Everything is fast. Bow, wham, bap, zap, whoop, bow, wham. Yes, yes. You like it up here. And, uh, he's, uh, Ian Richardson's a great actor. And, uh, to be able to do all of this stuff and spew out those lines as fast as that without missing a beat is the trick. I love the fact, and then again, by using the Brazil music under the samba beat, it turns it into this musical number. I keep 
all of, all these films, especially Brazil, are trying so hard to be a musical that don't quite happen. But they have those moments. Uh, one of the things that I don't know if people really can see is the door has been freshly painted badly. The idea was, and again, we missed it slightly, was that this room has just been made the night before. It's been, that door has just been put in. That wall has just been put in. Uh, the thing about this scene that I love the most is anybody who's ever worked in an office understands this. <laughs> this, is, this film proved to be really popular with office workers because it's all about you know, how big your office is. It's, it's measured in centimeters, if necessary, to, to distinguish. <laughs> But this is at least proof that you're moving up in the system. And, and again, where the, the Clark's pool was full of people, they were watching television, they were, you know, they were bustling. It really was as humane as you can make a bureaucracy. This is all these people on their way up who are isolated one from another, who don't speak to another, and yet are only concerned about whether they're moving up and the other person is moving down. There was a lady who was... Um, uh, part of the publicity department at uh, Universal and after she saw it she said she went home and she was showering that night and she started sobbing in the shower and she just couldn't stop and the fil film just sort of welled up and she just was just crushed by it and there was a New York lawyer I, I don't know personally but I know second hand who saw it went back to his office and closed the door. He didn't take any calls for three days he just sat in the office Now I think to have that kind of effect on people I, 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 you can't ask for anything more, as it seems to me. And Charles McEwen, this is, I think is one of his finer moments. Charles's face has become Mr. Punch's face, I think. His, his nose and his chin are almost touching. He's the most pitiful creature in, in the whole place. And Lime, I'm not sure if he is the third man or not, but uh, he might be. <laughs> And again, we're using all our posters on the wall to try to think. And I love, I mean, the way he, his place is being invaded by this man. And, and Sam is so at ease and casual, he just wants it. He doesn't actually understand the protocol in this world, just how important each inch of space is to a person. There's something about the movement of both these characters that I really love. I mean, I was going to shoot this in a more elaborate way, but just leaving it on the one shot, everything you need to see and know is done there. <laughs> and Charles is you know, the least likely to be interested in girls and dream girls. And uh, That's one of the nice surprises when you walk in, and there is Charles doing this wonderfully bizarre performance. It's just great. And... He's an extraordinary character. Uh, and it's very nice when you've got a writer who's an actor as well, because that helps in the development of the, of the characters. You know, when you're writing it, you're performing it, and you're not just performing it as a writer, thinking how an actor ought to do it. You're an actor doing it, and there is a difference in that. Um, the machinery that we use in this film is a lot of cheap teletype machinery. George Gibbs, the special effects supervisor, had come across uh, several cartons of old teletype machines that had never been opened, and, uh, and we sort of dragged them out, and they were very cheap, and out of those we assembled all of, a lot of the strange machinery. I love the thing of exposing uh, television screens. I mean, we, we got old Sony television screens, as small as we could find them, showing the guts all the time. It, very much that goes through all the film about showing the guts of the technology. I think our little executive toy, which features largely in it, uh, was based on, there was in Time Magazine, there was a picture of a sculpture that was done down in Battery Park in, in New York, and it was, it was this huge thing, and it looked kind of like a guillotine, and it looked like something, I wasn't sure what it was. And it was with that in mind that we built the executive toy. I liked the fact, and I wanted it to be like a guillotine, or it's like a cross between a guillotine and a hang, uh, uh, and, a, and a gibbet. 
Uh, and the way you hoist the thing up and he drops it, it, and it's a decision is made. It's kind of like Siskel and Ebert, you know, doing the manly thing. It's all done. Everything about that is hard and manly and knife edge. So it's it's very executive like. And then Siskel and Ebert have this manly approach to uh, film criticism where they have to dis have to do the manly thing of doing a thumbs up or a thumbs down playing the emperor. And and I was told by Gene Siskel that when I complained about this as being very damaging to films and filmmaking, this, this black and white approach, he said it was harder for him than I could ever imagine that to make that decision that each, when he approached a film, he knew he had to make this manly decision. And it wasn't easy, but a man's got to do what a man's got to do. And he would do that. So I, I really think it's, I think it's absolutely wonderful that we, um, Filmmakers get to spend years of our lives and, and millions of other people's money to make films to let Gene uh, Siskel prove once again that he's a man. You know, I've never got, I've only gotten thumbs down from him. I got one thumb up on Munchausen. Fuck him. <laughs> so that goes in there. Le leave it in. I mean, I'm, I'm all for that. <laughs> Tell them no. Tell them yes. Or was it a personnel carrier you took out from transportation? Send that up for security. Anyway, tie yes, it up, Lowry. There's a good chap. And get a new suit. Did you want the lift? There was a scene with the cleaning lady in the lift, uh, which we cut out, and I can't remember what happened in it. <laughs> Now the corridor is upstairs. Again, at each stage of Sam's progression, it becomes more and more clinical, more and more inhuman, more and more uh, sanitized. And one of the things that I really like is when we put this set together, uh, when they put up the tiles on the wall, the, the, the tiler leaves little bits of cardboard and inserts them between the tiles to keep the space there. And I decided to leave them on the set. They were strange, they were little things, and somebody might ask a question when they saw it, and I would get a chance to explain. <laughs> <laughs> it's me again showing that things just don't happen. They don't aren't just there. People are doing it. There's human touch even in the most inhuman moments. I mean, the hand uh, with all the uh, metal bits on was something I saw in a book on Victorian inventions. It was probably something to do with uh, some uh, cure to arthritis. But I liked it, and I love the idea of a typist typing with this thing and typing the transcript of a torture. And she's the sweetest person in the world. She's just like secretaries around the world. They just do what their bosses ask them to do, and they don't think about it. This is what secretaries do. This is why we hire them. Can I help you? And she's the cheeriest, the sweetest woman we could find, and yet doing this with no sense of what it means, of no sense of the, the awfulness. And I, that's one of the things that amazes me about the human animal, how it can separate its mind from reality and from awfulness and carry on. Again, it's another form of the Mrs. Terrain. These are the people, these are the survivors. These are the ones that keep the, the, the species going. They don't think about things. They just accept things or they approach them with uh, a positive joy and, a, and, uh, and they, they intrigue me. I don't, they usually drive me crazy, but on the other hand, I kind of like them because they are who they are. I'm sure those people exist all around the world in, in every secret uh, service organization. The CAI have got those people. They're out there. They do the job. They don't think about it. They do the paperwork. I think everybody in this world is doing that. There's hardly anybody who has escaped that way of thinking. Now, what's interesting about this scene with Jack, this is the only scene we shot twice in the whole film. This is the very first scene we shot. And we shot it with one difference. And it didn't work. And I thought long and hard about it, because here was a scene with Jack, the family man, the best friend, who happens to be this torturer. Like, he looks like a butcher when we first see him. And we had pictures of his happy family there, his wife on the, on, on the, uh, the desk. And we had hit the, all of these close-ups of them, and it didn't work. It didn't make the scene work. And then I realized what we had to do. We had to be more obvious. We had to have a little girl in the scene, not a picture of a little girl, but let's have a little girl playing with blocks to show what a good family man is. He's a sweet man. He loves his children. He plays with them. He's very delicate and caring. I need to find out about a woman. Come on, Chloe, let's show Uncle Sam here how we can make the word cat, shall we? I'm Holly. I'm sorry, love. So you are. This is her. Here's somebody who's got his brain split down the middle. He can do one job, and he can be the good family man and still be 
a functioning human being. The the objective attitude that you know Jack shows is really, I think, what America keeps doing more than anywhere. I mean, it's the idea that you somehow overcome the failings of your humanness by becoming objective, and you stand above it, and then everything is treated equally, fairly, all of that. That this will make a better world. The fact is, it makes a nightmare world. It's like it's it's. It's getting rid of passion. It's getting rid of all of the things that we're always told are primitive and base and uh, that society should be ridding itself of. And it scares me because the people like Jack Lint succeed in that world and they don't differentiate between delivering torture fairly and, uh, and objectively and uh, evenly or, or handing out uh, the presence in the, same, in the same form. It's done in the same way. And it's like the blood has gone out of society. Uh, and that's what's chilling. That's what scares me more than anything. I can deal with somebody who's crazed, who hates me. I can't deal with somebody who keeps a nice smile to their face, a level tone in their voice, and is objective. I got my daughter, Holly, who was three at the time, to uh, play the daughter. And what was interesting is that we had her for two days, and the first day, she played the scene uh, with the toys, and my elder daughter, Amy, was there as a chaperone, and it was all very jolly. And by the end of the day, she had had it. She you know, wasn't interested in movies and film stardom, and, and she didn't want to come back the next day, and she actually, when she got home, took a pair of scissors and chopped a chunk of her hair out, her bangs in the front, to make it impossible to use her the next day. And we had to force her practically down there to finish off the scene because we needed the last shot, which was Sam uh, with a suit about to change clothes and her saying, don't worry, uh, big boy, I won't look at your willy. Or put it on, big boy, I won't look at your willy. And she wouldn't say it. She wouldn't say it. There's a whole crew waiting. She wouldn't do it. And we had to get the entire crew to leave the set. I operated the camera. Maggie, my wife, handled the, the boom microphone and we had to sit there with our daughter <laughs> and force her eventually to say the words and I thought yeah, we truly have made a home movie here Hello big boy I want to look at your willy You've got to look the part to get the part Again I love the awfulness of the baggie escaping he's unable to see and the guards, you know, know he can't get anywhere, and they just let him go. And, and because of the noise, uh, the idea of a pinball machine we added to, to this made it make it even worse. And people, I love that moment because people laugh, and then they don't laugh. They're caught. That's what happens a lot in the film, where we set people up to laugh, and they start to laugh, and they realize this isn't funny, and there's a gasp. And it's it's part of the roller coaster ride that I really intended that. Uh, we raise them to heights of laughter and then say, uh-uh, not funny, this is terrifying. And then they plunge. And a lot of people resent that, and that's understandable, especially when you paid $7.50 to have a good time. And your life is already hard enough without this being inflicted upon you. The, the, the business of Jill arriving and the, the, the lift fighting him at all, I love it. Or again, where technology gets in the way of true love. Everything, everything is there on one hand to make life easier, except the moment when there you are, there's the girl of your dreams, and there she is, almost within touch, and technology takes that moment away from you again. It's really anti-everything that you are trained to expect in a film in many ways. We're constantly taking the rhythms you would expect and playing with them. And, uh, and that's where I think another, a lot of the audience hate it, because they don't want to be played with that way. The score of Brazil is pretty extraordinary, I think. I've got to give credit to Ray Cooper first, who is credited as uh, music coordinator. It's, it's nonsense. Ray, Ray is the one that first introduced me to Michael Kamen, and Ray I first work, worked with on Time Bandits, and uh, he's one of the great percussionists in the world, and uh, uh, he's also a good actor. And uh, he, he told me about Michael, and he said, I remember sitting in his car and he said, listen to this guy's stuff, this is great. And, and here was this music that it was for Dead Zone was what it was, actually. And it was this huge, it was like a sea of sound, this whoosh. It's very much, it's very Wagnerian or Richard Straussian. 
and and throw in a bit of Mahler as well. So, it, and then we met met Michael, and Michael is is sort of like you know the, the poor man's Demis Roussos, and it's a uh, he's a great, bullion, full of life character, and he's funny, and uh, and so we started playing on this score. And what was interesting is that. I wanted Brazil to be the theme of the thing, and Michael didn't want that. It was very clear. He wanted to write his own score, and I said, no, Brazil is it. Brazil is the song. And he said, I don't know, it's not even a good song. He, he argued against this. Ah, it's, 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 uh, I can't work with this. He said, sorry, that's, that's, these are the rules of this game. That's what we got. We got Brazil, and that's our theme. And I want you to try to pull themes out of that, try to use that. I think he was actually worried about the PRS, because of the publishing on things. If, if, if he includes X amount of Brazil and it, it all goes to Ari Barroso, who wrote the song, and not to Michael Kane. I'm not sure about this, and Michael will probably deny everything, but, <laughs> but these, these the suspicions linger occasionally. <laughs> anyway, he got to work, and, and it was invariably Ray, Michael, and me in this room battling about what we could do here. What, and Michael would come up with a theme. I got this one. And he's got, you know, he's got a bag full of themes he hasn't used yet. And mm, tries that one. And Ray said, yeah, but, oh, that'd be better if you throw it in the minor. Right, okay, in the minor. But I think here it ought to go ba 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 bum And we would sit there and make music. And Michael is brilliant. And his hands grab for chords. They just go there. And I would, I would say, no, it's slower. Da, 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 da. Down faster, and and we would go, and Michael would find it, and, and we would do these sessions, and out of that would come these themes. Uh, this wasn't true with all of it, because there were great chunks that Michael just wrote, and just and then would present it and say, "I would like this," and what do you think? And and we'd agree or disagree. But it, I can't see how other directors do. I mean, hand a film over after they finish the film. They hand it over to a composer. The composer writes the music, and then gives it back, and then there's usually a couple of bargaining. Uh, positions, and that's the end of it. And I find that extraordinary because the music is, um, when I'm watching a film, I think the music becomes like 50% like of the experience. You don't notice it a lot of the time, but it just informs the scene constantly. Hey, go! The idea of paper and litter, these are things that obsess me. Uh, and the idea to be caught in a situation with this clerk, everything about him, he's, he's breaking so many laws. He knows he's guilty, he's also littering, and he wants the girl, and he's, he's caught in all of these really Pavlovian responses that society has, has created for him. The dog with the plaster, the bandage over his bum hole, really is, again, part of my documentary approach to filmmaking. I saw that in Copenhagen. I was sitting there one day, and there's very, very, proper couple of people were out walking their dog and dressed beautifully and the dog turned around and there it was. Now I don't know whether it was because they were so conscious of the dog's possibility of soiling uh, you know, public spaces and, and so they dealt with it by, by bandaging him up or whether the dog had some terrible disease. I have no idea but it was one of those great funny moments and so throw it in the film and it and it somehow just ties up with a woman who's obsessed with litter and tidiness, and she's got a dog with a, that uh, she's dealt with. It's, I mean, that's what I think is funny, is some of the most bizarre things in the film are just, you know, what reality has shown me, not me and my grotesque imagination. It's the real world. I mean, the oxygen mask is, is what we see in, in Japan. I mean, they've got it already where people are, are, are breathing fresh air whenever possible. Uh, again, it's not. It's just I like throwing things away because there's a scene that could have taken place quite differently. But you've got a character in there who can react, and he's doing something that adds to the world that we don't. Now we know the world's air is polluted there. Nobody else is commenting on it. They, they're used to it now. Uh, and I love. The, I mean, the silliness of the moment of of Jonathan sticking his fingers in his coat pocket to say. Uh, I mean, there's there's something like play acting going on. He's He's, he's, he's watched too many movies, is what the character uh, of Sam Lowry has. He lives in that kind of fantasy world. And so, even though he gets it wrong and reveals the fact that he's only got two fingers, he still carries through the, 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 the action. What's interesting, it's, it's what Sam is about. The character of Sam has this, you know, these fantasies on there. On one hand, uh, infantile, because they're Superman fantasies, rescuing the girls. On the other hand, he's also got a need for, for love and, and, and an emotional relationship, and, and, and he's frightened of it. And in fact, what the film does do is that when he does let go and falls in love with Jill and does something to save her is when he then is destroyed by the system. 
And it's that was I think that's the interesting thing about that film. It's 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 about the fear of the vulnerability of being in love. Is a great part of it, and uh, he pays the price for falling in love. Sucker. <laughs> You don't believe me, do you? You, um, you, you probably think I'm, uh, 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 I'm bonkers, right? Mad, raving. I like, I mean, I like Jill. She knows, even though she's totally isolated herself, she still can play. She knows enough about how to treat people to uh, get what she wants. She's like a guerrilla fighter in this world. And uh, I don't suppose she and Tuttle are the two, uh, really efficient characters in there, the ones that know what they want and have framed their lives accordingly and are good at their work. And, uh, and they're very unique in that sense. Uh, this, uh, to finally get inside of her world, was like he can't believe his luck. And then when he's thrown out, when he's kicked out, What's interesting about this sequence, we only had a, a strip of roadway there that was maybe 150 yards long, which we had to keep shooting over and over again. We'd just drive the truck to one end, and we'd go back and do another take and start again. We kept driving over the same little patch of, patch of road. And I just love the impossibility of this thing. No matter what she does, Jonathan just clings on. And it's so... It's, so, it's something that she's never seen in, in her world, and that's what eventually sort of wins her over. It's so silly and relentless and desperate and, and foolish. And, uh, and it's a good sequence. I also think it's one of the best musical cues that Michael did. It's one of my favorite. I think it's just an extraordinary cue. It's funny and it's uh, dramatic and dynamic and everything all at the same time. Um, and this moment uh, of him the brace going on him flying over the front. I mean, the stuntman just had to do it. And it's it's a nice trick. <laughs> and it's a bit dangerous. And uh, we actually had something on the front of the truck to catch him. Uh, so it wasn't quite like falling under the titles. And I find when you know, that sequence happens, I gasp every time because it looks so convincing. And then this silly little Stan Laurel face peering over the thing. It's like, Kilroy was here is what it reminds me of, which is again, everything you know, in the 40s and 50s, the graffiti. With Jill, I was very much inspired by Annie Lennox at the time. That's when she was wearing her crew cut. We seemed to make Kim sexier the more we dressed her in men's clothes. There's something really sexy about, about a girl like that. I don't know why. I thought it was just wonderful going from the moment of the couple kind of falling in love to the happy house, except what comes out. I mean, the picket fence, everything. It's just outrageous, and it reveals power today. What is it to my progress? I don't know what it is, but it's so strange. I love the house, the image of the house. It's because it's, it's a domestic image, but it's really just one of those portable units that, that people have at building sites. And the idea of playing volleyball makes some fun-loving folk in there. It's, I was, I was very much concerned about trying to get through some of these uh, these protective layers that allow you to kill people without any concern. One of the things I liked when we were doing this, I'd seen a picture of a guy wearing protective clothing, rubber in his mask, and, and it was a strange photograph of him scrubbing a naked woman. And it was really powerful, and so we made these comps, costumes like that. And I, again, this was you know around the time with Star Wars where we have all these faceless soldiers that you can shoot left, right, and center. And that's why I like making, having them play volleyball. You're trying to make these people human, but they're wearing these total inhuman outfits. And this was um, out uh, east of London. It was an old refinery. And it was freezing cold this day we were there. It was absolutely freezing. And we had all this pyrotechnical stuff going on nonstop. And to create all the atmosphere, this, this hell-like atmosphere. We were burning tires all day, so there's black, bilious rubber smoke everywhere. The end of the day, everybody looked like they were in some kind of minstrel show. Michael's score, I find, it's so big, cause people weren't doing those kinds of scores. I mean, John Williams is doing his uh, Star Wars scores, but they're, I think, very simple in comparison to the Brazil score, because it, it's an unrelenting kind of score. It doesn't let you off the hook very often, like the whole film. This is a model that we shot. And I love the idea of this 
this corridor of beautiful images of countryside advertising different things and, and behind it is this, this this wasteland it's a really nice shot too because i think a lot of people are fooled and not realizing not realizing that it's a model shot sam and the, the bomb again you know we set all of that up because we have that shot of sam standing in front of a poster that's warning people to keep an eye out for, for bombs. And it's trying to tell a story on different levels so you don't have everything being in the dialogue. Uh, it's One of the things that was interesting with Jonathan, his voice is, is a much deeper, more intimidating voice. And I, my one bit of direction with Jonathan was to ask him to keep his voice high, to keep it light, so it, it made him weaker. Because when he uses it properly, it really goes down and it it's kind of intimidating, and, and I think that was almost my sole direction to Jonathan in this film. How many terrorists have you met, Sam? We shot this sequence of the, the driving in the studio, and we used an old uh, motorized backing, which is basically like a big roller that rolls the, the, the painted background behind the, the windows. And in the middle of the shooting, the, the thing broke down, and we ended up having to do all the shots of the moving background by hand. There were people at the top of the machinery dragging this roller blind around and around and around. If you notice this shot, it's backwards, the shot of the um, barrier, because we shot it the wrong way around, and, and we reversed it on the film, so the writing is backwards for those with really keen eyes. The, the Star Wars films created a kind of imagery that we're playing with in here with the stormtroopers and all, and they're everywhere. There's, again, when we made the film, the idea of all this chase stuff, again, was very much coming out of the Spielberg Lucas world of, of uh, chasing. And, and so some of it is Sam being caught up in the moment as if he was in one of those movies. It was like the, the audience was used to this kind of stuff. This place that we shot this shot was in Marnla Valley. It's where Euro Disney now is. And it was built by a Spanish architect called Ricardo Bofil. And it was an extraordinary place. Uh, we actually had a, a little Citroen camera car, and we just had the hood of the, the lorry on it, and we drove around shooting it. And then we intermixed it with model shots, these being model shots here, which the, the truck is probably two feet long in the model shots. And by mixing full-size cars, with um, the, the miniature stuff. I think we've, we've put it together so it's impossible to tell what's what. The tight shots of the spinning, these are all models. And uh, then by including a live action shot, it, it kind of blends the whole thing together. I mean, again, we're shooting it, you, you know, you're in your first week of shooting and you shoot what you think you need and then realize you haven't covered everything and then you end up faking it with models afterwards. We've been playing the thing like the Star Wars world where everybody, the bad guys die, and they, nobody cares because they're the bad guys, and we've got the good guys getting away. It doesn't matter what you do to the bad guys because you know, they're bad guys. And I thought it was really important to have that moment of the crash and the bad guy comes out and he's in flame. And it's not funny anymore. It's not heroic. It's not movies. It's like, Jesus, there's a guy really burning up, and it's ugly and awful. And I thought it was really important to try to do. I'm always... I think ever since John Wayne started killing Indians in large numbers, I've always been offended by the fact that certain groups of people, whether they're people with masks or Indians, get to be killed in large quantities without any, without any concern on the part of the killers. And so even the worst people in this film have a given moments when you should care about them in some way. Why we the... Lingerie shop. Why do we do lingerie? I don't know. I always find it's the embarrass embarrassing part of life being taken by your mother to buy lingerie. Uh, men don't belong in lingerie shops normally. <laughs> and so I thought, what better to have both a romantic and a, and a critical scene than in a lingerie shop? I think also the lingerie shop we probably chose because you then ended up in a mixture of mannequins and real people, so it was hard to tell what was alive, what was dead, what was living, what was... Uh, plastic and then the, the, the scene with the mirror here I've always loved mirror play and and we just faked it and it got better and better as we went along and uh, there's 
it's also something it's odd about seeing somebody's reflection because they're almost turning in on themselves sometimes they're splitting apart one moment and then turning in on themselves and it's kind of like visual schizophrenia is <laughs> what we're doing what has happened to you now my complication I had a little complication but dr chapman says i'll soon be up and bounding about like a young gazelle you're buying a Christmas present for your mother? What? Oh, um, yes, little... Charlie and I come here regularly. We love romantic lingerie. <laughs> I mean, I, it's almost obscene with Mrs. Terrain and her frilly split crotch panties or whatever it is she's waving in the air. These conjure up awful images in, in, in the mind, and, uh, and I love that because it's, it's both funny and, and disturbing. And I think the kind of the awfulness of being in a pink, pretty deco place for something like this to occur is just terrifying. Uh, in my original ideas about the film, the, the, the ministry didn't know whether there were terrorists out there or not because over the years they had so many counter agents and counter counter agents out there and agent provocateurs who maybe set explosions to lure people in. The people lost track of whether there really were terrorists or not. But the important thing was that the belief in terrorists had to be maintained to, to allow the ministry to continue to survive. Originally the film was called The Ministry. It was really about the survival of an organism like a great bureaucracy like that will do that will do anything to keep itself going. And sometimes in this world, it seemed to be people were more willing to believe in the, the idea of terrorists than in the inefficiency of the technological system, which constantly is blowing up and going wrong. And it's, it's how you choose to view the world is what it's about. And we do it every day of our lives. We make assumptions that Sam constantly is doing and has proved wrong. What was interesting about Kim, we did screen test with her and, and and I had seen so many different actresses I mean all the ones that became stars almost and I kept looking for somebody that nobody knew I really wanted the dream girl to be an unknown and, and uh, yet Kim did something in her screen test that was unlike the others it was a, kind of a strange animal quality when she was pushed to the limit she did some of her best stuff I used to do things just to irritated, like having extras walk in and bump into her just as she's about to do something. And these little sparks of anger that would come off her when I, when I did that, they're all on film. See where I'm going. There's a great Niagara of perspiration coming down. Mm. Well, I'm lucky. Here we're you know, trying to humanize the guards to make them less than just faceless. I, had, I mean, I, had, I remember some years ago talking to George Lucas about evil. And, and I was saying that Darth Vader isn't evil because he's black, you know, he wears his black costume. He's like the cowboy with the black hat. You see him coming a mile away, you know this is the bad guy. And so that to me isn't really worrisome because you can see it. What's evil is Jack Lint, the person who's the best friend, the nice guy, who does what he does. And that's evil. And so all along the line, we you know, kept trying to let the Darth Vaders of this world be seen to be people in there with... Uh, with real problems, or even silly problems. This is, you know, this is the mail truck going on with its delivery of, of, of bodies. And I think, again, they, I'm sure they think it's probably more humane in a society to do it that way because it's, it's, it's efficient, you know, they hang there. Everything works smoother, so people are less inconvenienced. Regulations. These are all model shots here. Built match model of valet. Again, one of the things we did in the film was use wide angle lenses, I think more than probably have ever been used before. Maybe, maybe Kubrick on Clockwork Orange, but we were really pushing the limits of how far you could go with using wide angle lenses as standard lenses and not using them just as tools for distorting. In, in this shot, I mean, we're distorting purposely, but in a lot of the other rest of the film, we're we're using them because they seem to provide, uh, create a feeling of both um, 
agoraphobic wideness, you're seeing an incredible amount of information at the same time, it's claustrophobic. So it's both wide and closed at the same time. And it's, you seem to me more in the film than you, when you use longer lenses, it distances you a bit from everything. In this way, you seem surrounded by the film, which is, for some people, a bit too much to take. My wife actually prefers it on video because it distances it a bit and it's less threatening. In the cinema on a big screen with surra surround sound and this, these images that seem to be all around you, it's, it's pretty rough. To see if she's been arrested. I'm sorry, Sam, I'm afraid this whole case... I mean, the detail of, of Jack going home and putting on a bulletproof vest to go home. That's what he's doing there. I just think it's so funny because he thinks he's important enough and recognizable enough to be attacked. I don't see how he, no, anybody would ever recognize him, know him. He's so, so safely ensconced inside the ministry. But you can't be too safe. I also was pleased that we, what we reintroduced was glass blocks in sets. Nobody had been using glass blocks in sets for a long time. And I, I loved building this, this world with glass blocks. That's the beauty of it. Our job is to trace the connections and uh, reveal them. There's something about this scene that always reminds me of dealing with Hollywood. <laughs> it's when you're going well, you've got lots of friends, but the minute you start having any problems, it's amazing how they disappear. And again, everybody, they've got these simple answers about how things work, and Jack's mind is work, works in this way of connecting things. He's got enough, enough circumstantial evidence which proves the world works in the way the ministry thinks the world works in. And it's, uh, it's impersonal and it's, it's supposedly objective, but it's, it's, it's not the facts. And I think, you know, again, we, we're constantly getting caught in, in patterns of perception that, we, uh, that are easier to accept and deal with than the reality, the more complicated reality. And, uh, I mean, when we got into the, these pneumatic tubes, I, I remember them always as a kid in department stores. They fascinated me. The idea that you put receipt and money and it went off to somebody else. There was somebody else somewhere beyond the walls, up somewhere in an attic where other things were happening. They always implied a much more elaborate world out there of things going on. And they started playing with us. And then, and the theme that started coming out musically was The Sorcerer's Apprentice, which was, it was great. I mean, it, it is, it's exactly that with the, the brooms multiplying and going out of control and then zap. And, and his ability to do something as simple and silly as turn the system in on itself. And when it, when it is turned in on itself, it explodes and becomes truly a Christmas scene. And there's snow falling everywhere. It's, it's, it's a Christmas card for Sam. Musically, we try to do again, we got a good saxophonist in there. There's always that sense of you know, night in the city and the lonely saxophone playing. You know. It's that awful feeling, too, I think, of that loneliness of you've finally done your rebellious act and think you've really achieved something, but the reality is it just leaves you even more empty than before. And the invasion of the flat, I mean, once we had opened the Pandora's box of what Spore and Dowser can do to the flat, well, we, we just went all the way. And again, it's that, again, it's nice coming out of the ministry in that sort of cold, foggy chill to come to, into a polar region, basically. <laughs> I can't remember where George Gibbs found these suits in there. They were, I can't remember what they were used for originally. But uh, again, there's the real world just being there. We're not inventing this stuff. <laughs> And I've always had this thing about noses pressed against glass or plastic, as the case may be. Authorizing the compulsory temporary. And you know, them having their their. This makes their this makes their life worthwhile. This is what these guys live for: the little moments when they can really take you know get their revenge on on everybody else in the world who's who's better than they are. Movement uh, using the, that, that drill, that was again Bob's movement. He practiced a long time on the way, he whipped that drill out like a, it could either be a, a weapon, like a knife or a sword, or it could do its job. And then there's nothing more fun than cheap juvenile scatology 
And uh, <laughs> I mean, that's, I love moments like this because here people talking in very you know proud intellectual academic terms about this film, and then here we go. We just let people get stuck in the shit. <laughs> There's not that much impro improvisation in the film. Um, Brazil was pretty much written and then performed. This was actually quite interesting to do because the first part we did have Derek and, and Bob in these suits taking this stuff, being pumped in. And then when it got later, we had to replace them with stuntmen. And the only way we could do it, actually, was to get these large tanks, because the weight of this stuff is incredible. That much liquid inside weighs a ton, and nobody could stand up, so they actually had to be in tanks of, of liquid water that was balancing it for the final bits. And these are stuntmen in there. And that's, that, see, that's absolutely terrifying, doing that stunt, because they have no way out. We had X amount of time for them to hold their breaths while this stuff was pumped in, and then we got the shot and then had to release all this stuff quickly while they, before they actually drowned in it. There was no simple way out of that one. It's, it's very interesting looking back at the number of people who I, I didn't use who then went on to become very famous. Yeah. Yeah, it was very close. Ellen Barkin, Jamie Lee Curtis, Rebecca De Mornay, Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, Roseanne Arquette, you name them. We saw them all. Kathleen Turner, uh, Madonna, before she was famous. Uh, I went through everybody, but all of them had been seen in one film or another and all made an impression. And I still kept fighting that. I wanted somebody nobody had a clue about. <clears throat> as, as De Niro flies away, that's a little lead figure, and it's about two inches tall on a wire. And Michael's music in there is very funny. Da, 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 da. It's kind of like sort of Robin Hood music. Da, 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 and it's this silly sort of fanfare. Very tuttle. And that came just out of the name. All Michael was doing was trying to make Harry Tuttle into a heroic theme. And this is a film about hats. I always loved films in the 30s and 40s. Hats were very important. And somehow modern filmmaking has reduced the number of hats out there available for, for films. The designs in, in Mum's flat, it's all Egyptian. Everything is Egyptian. It's all about eternal life, mummification. It's, uh, or mummification, I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's all there. Uh, this apartment was, uh, again, the, the idea of the ducts in here was that they, this was an old apartment that had been once very beautiful, but the ducts had invaded that just to provide whatever central services could provide. You know, you spend all your money on the aesthetics of the place, but you destroy it all to get the goodies that the system provides. But what, what to me, the important thing about the ducting was that people, no matter how much money and care they spent on decorating their, their, their world, they were, would happily destroy that for the benefits of this modern society. And it's, it's, it's a kind of brutalization of aesthetics that, uh, that intrigued me. I love trying to do this kiss to drag out as long as possible. Just drag out a moment and then... And, and <laughs> There's one bit that I'm really not certain about. We slammed on this very big, loud, silly cue, musical cue at this point. And I still don't know if that was the right thing to do. I went back and forth, back and forth. In the end, again, because our attitude was, oh, well, let's go for it. We did it. And I think it actually overpowers the moment. And it's one of the things I might change whenever I remake this film. It's like, for the first time, she's relaxed. She's, you know, able to not be so defensive and just be a woman. She falls for this, some of this soft, nice stuff. This was a model we built in the ministry. It was about 12 feet high. It's again, I love the people who make things go, the cleaners, the plumbers, the operatives. They're, and these, they sort of come out at night, and I like, by using the ducts in that way, they seem like sort of 
worms that come out at night. These creatures are long, snaky things doing their business of cleaning up like snails or, or, or earthworms, whatever they do at night. I don't know, but I know it's important work. I, when I make a film, I don't do it very intellectually. I, I don't approach it in, 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 in an intellectual way or an uh, analytical way. I'm doing it as an, um, it's an emotional expression of something. And it's only afterwards when I read reviews and people start writing about it that I realize what I've done. And, uh, and I want to keep doing that. I don't want to be too self-aware when I approach things because I find when you do, you then start getting clever. You start... Uh, start worrying about the wrong things. And I just know I had to get this, this shit out of my system. And Brazil was the, 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 the big flush. <laughs> this was done in a power station, a Croydon power station, which no longer exists. This really is the last record of uh, a stage of technology in Britain that is now in the past. And again, the shift. I mean, again, reintroducing Christmas here very strongly with, with the guards and their little choral group. It's almost like toy soldiers. Everything is shiny and spit polished and sharp. And uh, I never know if we've gone too silly or not with this stuff, but it always makes me smile. The idea of seeing these, these guys in their Nazi helmets and all, and they're, they're just doing what people do. I don't know, I, unlike a lot of directors, I was an animator first, which I think distorts your, your viewpoint um, immediately. I mean, anim with animation, or even before animation, I was a, a cartoonist, so you're, you're looking at the world through a caricaturist's eyes that you distort, you make ordinary things appear grotesque. And so I see the world that way, and I don't, to me, it seems normal. I only discover after having made a film that to others it's not normal, but to me, it's the way I see the world. So there is that immediate uh, difference in the way I perceive things. Animation was interesting because, again, you perceive film uh, in a frame-by-frame -frame sequence rather than a scene with actors just going moving about saying lines. I can I sort of see 24 frames a second, and, I, and when it comes to doing special effects, this is fantastic. You actually can, can work them out in, in, in a more sensible way. I also coming from both those backgrounds with storyboards. I draw it out like a, like a, a comic book. Uh, and so the film immediately has, I think, this, 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 this uh, strange or, or caricatured or distorted quality before I even come up with a weird idea. <laughs> the advantage of being a, a cartoonist animator is that you just got a piece of paper and a pen and you can create worlds with that. You don't need actors, studios, scripts, right? You don't need anything, you do it all yourself. So, you know, years of working like that made me work from just my point of view rather than trying to please other people. Uh, I suppose that's what artists are supposed to do, and I you know, occasionally, in my more pretentious moments, think I'm trying to be an artist. And, uh, and I don't want to do committee films. I don't want to work that way. I don't want democracy to rear its ugly head when it comes to filmmaking. I don't want, you know, that's why I don't like uh, when we have uh, sc uh, screenings, um, preview screenings because I think a lot of the principle of that is that democracy is part of the process rather than using the screenings to find out whether we're conveying what I want to convey successfully or intelligently. Uh, it's used to see what do the people want and let's change the film to give them what they want. And I think that's bullshit, that's utter crap. Uh, if you don't like this story, then let's make another story, let's rewrite it and we'll make another film. But this is the story we all agreed to, to tell when we set off on this venture and we got actors involved, we got all these people involved because they all agreed to participate in the telling of this particular story with that particular ending. And, and we're storytellers and that's what we should be doing. And uh, if people like it, great. If they don't, fair enough too. And so the trick is not to change the film but to find all the people that are gonna like it and make sure every one of them come to the cinema. And if they s succeed in that, we will have a very successful film. That's my argument. Now, the film industry ought to work that way. It spends millions and millions of dollars to advertising agencies and television to try to achieve that, but they don't actually do that. They spend, it's easier for them to put pressure on the filmmaker, who's the most vulnerable person in the process, to change what he does, to, uh, to achieve success. And every filmmaker wants success so desperately. And at the end of the day, when they finish working on a film for a year or so, editing it, they're usually these very, very, uh, terrified little creatures who want so much to be loved and their work to be loved that they will do almost anything to make it a success. And a lot of time people buckle under the pressure and they chop the films, they change them in the hopes that these people in their large offices speaking with uh, 
sonorous voices uh, and dignified words know how to make the film successful so they, they fall into that trap of listening to them, changing the film and ending up without a success and then in the end when their film isn't a success those people aren't there to share the blame or responsibility, they're, they're long gone. And so in the end the filmmaker is the only one who bears the weight of the success or the failure of the film and the responsibility. They're the ones that get blamed. They're the ones that end up in the reviews named and fingers pointed to. So they're the people that really have to fight and fight and fight so that they're not made absolute fools of when they fail. I don't mind if I fail on my own terms. I don't want to fail on other people's terms. Wow, what a little speech that was. <laughs> Jill Layton is dead. Care for a little necrophilia? Hmm? This is a cheap and funny line. <laughs> we were wondering, I didn't know how to end this scene. I just didn't want to do another, you know, sex in bed scene. And, and somebody said, come on, look up here. And we looked down to the top and saw that opening and said, wow, that's great. And then I said, but we can twist this. And we did a twist and it irised perfectly. It was like an old fashioned film doing an iris. And, I, and it was one of those moments of just stumbling on the solution on the set. Um, the film was about to open and as always, there's this incredible pressure to shorten, shorten, shorten. And I suddenly had the thought that maybe I ought to chop the scene the morning after scene out of the film. And I did it literally on the premiere print. We made a physical cut in it and it went out that way. And as soon as I'd made that and it was out there, I suddenly realized I'd made a mistake, but it was out there. The film was out in Europe that way. And so the European video version, I reinstated the morning after scene. And I like it a lot. It's an important thing because I felt the idea of you know thinking Jill's there and then discovering it's a wig and then seeing her wrapped up with a, a real present for an executive was a really nice thing. And it ga also gave them a real moment together. When, by cutting it out, I felt we had just cut everything too fast, too tight. There was never a moment. And now we have a moment which is interrupted. But at least it's post-coitus interruptus as opposed to pre-coitus interruptus. <laughs> There's something awful about, you know, two naked people with all of these guys with masks and, and this heavy gear on. It's ugly, it's awful, and satin sheets. It's, just, it's like the two sides of the world, just in direct confrontation, the inhumane, brutal side, and the very soft side that's not allowed to, to survive. Then the processors we cut out of the American version, this was one of the cuts, and again, a cut I'm not particularly happy with, but it was at the time a compromise that I could live with. And I love this endless world, when you actually get into the world, of what's going on with these people. It's, it's, it's like limbo. We built this set, there's hardly a set there. It was just sheets of plastic we hung around these desks. And I love the fact that we could, it was, it was made so that we could see the silhouettes of other offices, other uh, processors, and these bodies being taken through uh, on, the, on the conveyor belts. ...distribute the good name of the government and standing within the community of the Department of Information Retrieval. Attention to disrupt the Ministry of Information Retrieval's internal communicating systems. Wasting ministry time and paper. Now, either you plead guilty to say seven or eight of the charges, which is going to help. I love the fact that, again, they, they summons up all these charges against him, and then little by little it started shifting from all the charges to how you deal with it financially. And suddenly they became business advisors. They became... <laughs> And it, it's, it's terrifying, it, it's, and that's what I find is so inhuman about it. It's one thing to have charges read against you, but then to be advised uh, how best you can deal with it, the financial burden that you will be uh, um, stuck with is, is terrifying. Sam, what are we going to do with you? This Father Christmas scene, again, was cut out of the American version. And again, it's a scene that I really love where the, the terrifyingness of a man dressed as Santa Claus in a wheelchair in the middle of this thing. And, and, and Sam is so much more pathetic and weak. And, uh, and he's come to the man who really, this is really sort of like a surrogate father who has nothing but silly little sporting metaphors to use as ways to get through it. It's, it, it's interesting, in the American version, we cut immediately from the arrest 
to the pullback in the torture chamber. And I think it's a, actually it's a really good cut. It's a very powerful moment. But I really hated losing this in the previous scene because I think they to tie everything together and make the end even more painful. You're running up an enormous bill by not cooperating. Please. No, I think what's going on here is that things like Christmas. I loved Christmas. I also felt Christmas had then been betrayed by the American, uh, the greediness of America had become institutionalized. It had become a ministry of goodwill. And it was like hard to experience it on an individual level, personal level. It became part of this larger uh, society. And it's, I suppose at Christmas, you're, at a time you're very vulnerable because you're getting and giving. And uh, people are getting and giving here a lot in this society, but what they're being given or, and what they're getting is not particularly nice. And I think that that's what was very important about that film. It's not an easy film. It's, it was, I mean, I, I really keep thinking it's like sort of cinematic rape. It is, it's, you know, it's like, or a mugging. It's just, you, you drag them in uh, under false pretenses, or maybe not false pretenses. They get in the cinema, and then they're just beaten, <laughs> senseless. They rip, and it's this terrible roller coaster. You just jerk this way and that, and you're laughing, and then you're plunged, and it's, and it's relentless. It never stops. I was, I was really shocked when I saw it a few weeks ago. I said, I mean, I wouldn't make it that way now. It was clearly another guy who made that, and I'm not sure if I like it. <laughs> Can't keep the orphans waiting. <laughs> this track back is one of my favorite moments. We shot it at four frames a second. And we ran back as fast as possible with that, uh, with the the dolly, and it meant that the actors, John and the uh, the uh, soldiers, were acting very, very slowly at like a fraction of their normal speed. So it, it seemed normal speed when we ran it at 24 frames. Again, the guards, like a fatherly guard in the midst of all this, saying, "You know, relax." They're, everybody's giving them advice. Everybody's trying to be nice in the society, <laughs> and I find that always intriguing. I think that may be true in a lot of cultures. The worse it gets the more it sort of brings out the goodness in certain people, but they're all powerless in the society. They're all going along trying to make it as decent as possible, but the basic rules of the game are just unbearable. Uh, we shot this scene inside a cooling tower in a power plant, and I've always wanted to see what they were like inside, poke my head in one day, and there they were. This platform we're on, we built, and it's about 30 feet above the ground. The ground is way below us, and shooting this was the most difficult scenes we shot in the whole film because we had to build platforms every time we wanted to stick the camera out there. We were working 30 feet in the air all the time and it was freezing cold and raining most of the time. The best thing about it was that at the end of each day I would sit there and you're in this totally this great gray cathedral, round womb-like cathedral and there at the top it's open to the sky and there would be this blue sky and occasionally a cloud or a plane would float by and I thought it was one of the truly religious buildings I've ever sat in. And also in, in dead center there. If you made a noise, the echo came back louder than it left your mouth. There was some strange acoustical trick that was being played in there. And it was great working in there. Um, I just threw out a lot of strange and dangerous images for, for uh, torture implements from you know Black & Decker drills to a child's rubber ball. I don't know if that's because Holly plays in there or not. And then we built, I mean, again, I built what is effectively a cross between a dentist chair and a, and a uh, hairdressing salon chair. I'm not sure which is more, more frightening experience to have your hair done or your teeth. No, Jack, please. Jack, no, don't. Please, Jack, no. People often wonder when the dream starts at the end. I think we're there. There's, there's something about your best friend doing it, and I love the, I love the dialogue about Jack blaming Sam for getting them in this situation. You bastard, how could you do this to me? <laughs> this abseiling down was done after a lot of discussion because we didn't know if we could do it. And in the end, these stuntmen were phenomenal. They abseiled down, and then, wearing those silly masks, some of them would land on these those ribs that go out, and the ribs were probably nine inches wide, and then they ran forward um, 
with their with their guns in their hands uh, on these ribs with these masks that were blocking their vision. It was all of this was incredibly scary working out here. And this is like movies now. We're making movies. We got gunfights, people shooting each other. And I just wanted to play it that way because he's now. How do you escape from this? You escape by being rescued like you get rescued in the movies. And I think, again, in the midst of all that, one keeps the jokes coming. Uh, and she's just doing a job still. There's no brain involved in her work. She just does her work. <laughs> Uh, there's something strange about them taking the lift down. I mean, I, I thought it was a bizarre moment, but I did it anyway, because, I mean, for all these, these so-called terrorists to be taking a lift down, it's just, I mean, the whole thing is, doesn't make any sense. And we started shooting this. I got really bored with the idea of people shooting each other. It just, it just got me bored. So we started to make it interesting so we added you know some of the, the video games to try to make it more interesting and and then eventually you know we get into a situation of doing our homage to battleship Potemkin and most of it is done just to keep me from getting too bored shooting an action sequence I'm always impressed with directors who do these kinds of sequences and love shooting them because after a certain point they don't interest me I don't know what to do with them I mean once you've killed a few guys what are you doing you just got a few more to kill and so, to me, what I liked was the combination of people wearing silly masks and then doing Battleship Potemkin. I'm sure there's many film societies that read into that a lot, but it's really me just fighting boredom. It's also nice to, to uh, make reference to the, some of your favorite films. Uh, everybody loves the word homage. I mean, stealing is more like it. Uh, these shots are, again, interesting. Those are the first kind of match shots we have done. You'll see the vehicle going past here, and you'll see the backgrounds here in a little bit. But this was now, I mean, we'd now really entered into, like, a juvenile fantasy stage. As macho stuff, you get to you know, shoot, you get to blow up everything that has ever hurt you, terrified you. It's a nice way to end, to suddenly go in, and you've got one go. You built this huge model that had taken months to build. It had taken a week to set the charges, and you're one go. <laughs> and, and you go in there, you set all the cameras, and you put it, it's in this confined space. You step out, and then you blow it. And you don't know until the next day whether you've got any of it on film. And uh, I think it was the last shot we did, and it was wonderful to do that at the end of this very, of nine months. Again, the paper is what I love. It's just the idea, to me, once we've done the great explosions, it really is about this paper coming down. These are like lives that are now freed. Their, their spirits <laughs> can now blow wherever they need to blow. <laughs> the shopping center was, was just a, a nice set to try to do. I mean, what I did is take a lot of, sort of neon signs and blew them up, sections of them, really huge, and, and placed them around there. I always loved people sort of climbing around the uh, neon signs in, in, in uh, movie theaters. But the idea, again, I mean, I don't know what people are thinking going on when you've got this hero taking his clothes off and keeping the city tidy at the same time and papers blowing around the place. They're just, it's, it's, and this is one of the things I enjoy most was to only now reveal Robert De Niro's face, totally, just as he's about to die. <laughs> and I thought, lots of fun. Now, we had a little problem here because... All the papers that were supposed to be on it were all supposed to be receipts. And the fact is, on the day, the receipts that we had made on lightweight paper weren't light enough to do what they were doing. And we had, the only thing that was light enough was, um, I think it was called the Jewish Chronicle. It was from a Tel Aviv, uh, it was a Tel Aviv newspaper that was on airmail paper. It was the only stuff light enough to stick to them. And so we had to fake it. So in fact, all of those papers aren't what they should be, which is just receipts. But we didn't have time to reshoot anything. We didn't. We had to keep moving forward. That was the problem with the film. Is we, we made the film for about thirteen and a half million dollars, and there was no time to go back on anything. If something didn't work on the day, we had to just fake it. We had to keep it going. And the way we did the paper, sticking to it in some of the early shots, is it was actually all shot backwards. So all the passers-by are walking backwards, and we had the paper stuck to them and all attached with little wires, which were then jerked away. Uh, so. And then when it was printed the other way around, 
papers had rushed up and stuck to him. Again, you know, we saved a lot of money by using sections of the, the lingerie department store as the shopping center. Everything was constantly reused. We always reassembled bits and pieces. Now here's where I made a mistake. In that blackness above that pediment, there's supposed to be a cross, and we were going to put it on at the end, and at the last minute we'd actually done it and I pulled it off, and I think it's a big mistake. I think it would be much better to show the cross there, it's like running towards, you know what the goal is that he's running towards, and I can't remember why I didn't do it. Something, I don't think the effect was working quite right in the last minute because we'd run out of time, I just pulled it off. Uh, mistake. This was in a place called the Rainbow Room, the top of the department store in London. And again, I just loved using all this black velvet. It makes a strange kind of limbo. And the sky with all these concentric ovals is like a twisted version of you know, heaven that one sees in, in Renaissance and medieval paintings, the layers of heaven rising up. Uh, and this is my Fellini part anyway. It's a strange, everybody's getting stranger and stranger. She came to us physically new. She goes then. Robert's not so physically new, but the spirit never grows old. <clears throat> Madame Lowry. <laughs> the idea of this was that th this isn't Jill becoming the mother. This is the mother becoming a very young girl and who just happens to look like Jill. Uh, so all of my Oedipus tendencies are not true. Uh, and I, I, but I couldn't think of anything better at that point for a nightmare situation to have mum younger than you, unable to admit that she was your mother and she looked like your girlfriend. I mean, that's, a, that's enough for anybody to go wacko. Uh, what's interesting is that we had done both Kim and we did Catherine playing the young mother. And we really weren't certain which one would work better, to be honest. And it was originally just going to be Jill. And then by slipping Catherine in there at the end, I thought it was kind of interesting because you then really don't know what you're seeing, what, what is and isn't. Um, the remains of Mrs. Terrain was pretty rough for a lot of people, but uh, it was even rougher for us shooting it because that stuff had to be kept refrigerated because it was foul. It was truly foul stuff. And by the time we got around to shooting it, it was, it was the end of a very hot and, and painful day, and I have no idea what was put into that stuff. I think it probably was real human flesh in there. They don't ask these questions, but it was, it was, it was truly awful. Uh, this nightmare, I mean, everything was happening now, and I, it was almost too much to bear. I remember when I first saw this stuff, it was just, it pounds, and you can feel the audience just gasping. It's, you'd be, almost begin to hyperventilate it, just because it won't let up. Just one awful, awful nightmare image to the next. There was something about that great pile of, of you know, the detritus of society, of civilization with washing machines and everything that Sam has to climb. It's, it's a very anti-materialistic film. I like to think. I don't know, I, I, I have an aversion to try to hit things too hard. And I, I usually prefer to err on the side of, uh, of pe assuming that people are intelligent or quick and will get it rather than nailing it over the head. And I'm probably wrong in this, because when I look at a Hitchcock film and see when there's a key clue, how many times he shows you a close-up, I mean, whether it's a key or something, there's no chance that anybody doesn't get it. And I, I kind of avoid that. There's a side of me that pulls against it. Um, and I may be wrong in doing this, but maybe it, it forces people to come back and decipher. Maybe it's my clever attempt to try to get people to see my films over and over and over again. And, make more money. It's all about me making money. <laughs> I mean, to me, the, the, uh, the house, it was this whole thing. There's something domestic about it. it it's totally undomestic, but it is domestic. It's a house, it's a home, a place away from it all, if you, if you put it on the right truck and go the right places. This shot was, always reminded me, the end of Brazil, uh, Blade Runner but we actually shot it. 
We actually had another scene in here, which appears in the Sid Scheinberg version, which was Jill coming into the little house, and uh, Sam is waking up, and so we linger longer with the two of them before we pull the plug on the happy romance. Some people I know find that Sam, they think he's dead, which I find odd because he's moving. There's a bit of stigmata there on that hand for those uh, who are, have a bit of religious background. <laughs> but what's extraordinary is the number of people you talk to who think he's dead. He's humming, he's moving, his eyes, there's movement in his eyes, and they don't want to see it, that he's dead. Maybe it's easier for them to accept him being dead than living in a strange kind of lobotomized way where he's escaped in his mind. Um, but to me, I mean, he has, he's actually won. He's won in a strange way. It's, uh, he's free in his mind. And to me, this is the optimistic ending. This is the happy ending. <laughs> because the unhappy ending would be killing him. Uh, but within those rules, within that society, the only way ultimately he could escape them is by escaping deep inside of his imagination. And, and there he goes. It's, it, was, I mean, one of the, it was one of the, the premises that started this whole pro process. I wanted to see if I could make a film where a man goes mad and it's a happy ending. Uh, and I don't know if I achieved it, but this is what we made. Now... The ending of the European version is just the Sam in the torture room humming and the music coming up, nothing changes. In the American version, the clouds begin to slowly fill up and the room vanishes in clouds, just leaving him still in the chair and on the, the ramp. Now, in the, in the script, I had both endings. I really couldn't make up my mind which way to go. And so it was, it was nice to be in a situation where I could try both and have my cake and eat it too. What I found interesting, I remember when um, I talked to somebody who saw it in Europe first and then saw it, I saw them in Chicago when I was uh, promoting the film. And they swore that the European version had the clouds at the end, which is exactly what I would hoped because I wanted people to feel as if the room had disappeared and we were in his, in his mind. And for the American one, we had a chance to actually do it literally. Uh, I think it's very beautiful with the clouds at the end, frankly. Both endings sort of make me chilly. The European one is so uncompromising. Uh, I think it's absolutely right. Europe is just that little bit more <laughs> used to those kinds of images. And I think there was a chance where I'm caught being an American in Europe, and one side of me wants to be Pollyanna, and the other side wants me to be uh, a sophisticated, nihilistic... Uh, a philosopher, and uh, so I've, I've been able to do both. <laughs> I think I learned, I, if I learned something, I learned I hadn't lost my basic hatred and fear of Hollywood and all the, 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 the anger I'd built up in the years I was living here, wanting to get into films and not liking the system and basically despising the system and, uh, and eventually leaving. And so it was, it was, it was almost like a fight that had to happen. It was waiting to come, that flight. I don't think I've got too much to apologize for when it comes to Brazil. <laughs> it was like, I still, it was at the end of all of it, after the making of it, the doing of it, it was one of those really exhilarating experiences. I just think it was great to have one of those in your life where you do exactly what you want to do and push the parameters farther than you're supposed to push them and get away with it. I think the nicest thing in all of it, the, the moment I really remember was after finally getting the film out in the States. I mean, having seen it out in Europe, having this huge battle, and then like, you know, almost, you know, the best part of a year later, finally getting it out in the States. I opened Time Magazine and there was Richard Corliss's review and it said, what a wonderful gift. And it, uh, it was just, a gushing review, and it actually, I remember running through the streets of New York at Christmas time, and it was the Christmas gift I wanted, and, and there it was, it was like, just the, uh, the real world was much more joyous and wonderful at Christmas time than this one I had invented in my brain uh, on film, and uh, they're both real, and uh, they're both true, and uh, one of them had a, had a real happy ending, not a intellectually uh, justifiable happy ending. <laughs>